Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience, breaking away from a little bit of sports today and something I want to kind of get into more. Maybe this will be the first of, well, I've done some sports movie rankings. There's more of those to come, but just general talk about movies. Big into movies, if people didn't know, especially from like 20 years ago. Not so much now. Don't have time for it. But today we are talking about the best movies of 1999. The Ringer just put out a gigantic list, the top 50 movies of 1999. So we'll talk about that list as well, and that's what inspired this. I mean, just because they do it doesn't mean that we can't do it too. It doesn't mean that you can't do it. So if you want to get into a draw for 20 DK bucks, there are two ways to do it. Smash the like button for the episode, leave your DraftKings handle in the comment section, and give me your five favorite movies from 1999. Also, if you want to leave a five-star review on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher with your DraftKings handle, something nice about the show, you too will be in a draw for 20 DK dollars. I might even have to break this down into like, you know, we've done movie rankings. There's a new Tarantino movie coming out. Maybe we'll have to do some Tarantino rankings in the future. Maybe some Mayo movie classics to give me a platform to finally talk about Southland Tales like I've always wanted to do with other people, like the four other people that have seen that movie, really want to deep dive into that. But I wanted to really bring it all in for this one because it's an incredibly good year for movies. Really tough to whittle down. We're going to do our top fives, talk about that ringer list, maybe some box office, the Oscars that year, and just guilty pleasure movies. And to join me to break this all down, a double dip from Roto Grinders. We got both Sammy Reed and Dean Shavels. And Dean, thanks for being on. Yeah, I am thrilled. I am giddy. I, I saw uh, you, sl- you slid in the DMs the other day. You say, hey, you want to jump on the podcast and talk about movies from 1999? I'm like, there is literally nothing more I'd rather do than that right now. Uh, and like you said, it is completely loaded as far as uh, 99. It's like the 41 Yankees. I, I, I'm playing MLB DFS tonight. And I'm going to have a harder time on DK. I'm going to have a harder time, uh, you know, making my, uh, you know, easier time making my lineups tonight as opposed to picking my top five movies from, from uh, you know, 99 because it's just – it's ridiculous. It's absolutely loaded. And uh, this this Ringer uh, article, it, it, I, I disagree with some parts of it, but uh, it's I don't know how you whittle down the five. We're going to make it work, but uh, I'm excited to get this started. Yeah, well, especially with the Ringer list, like there's so much group think that goes into it. You're taking like 15 different people, then taking averages, and you see what ends up at top. So even what the number one movie is, although I, I mean, a lot of people probably voted for it for number one, but you know, it could be like eight on someone's list. It's like the preferential balloting at the Oscars, where if you just come second in all of them and get a few first, you're probably going to win. Sammy, I spent more time on these rankings than I do on my weekly football rankings. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I think we could have done our own top 50 list, and it would have been great. Like we could just do a four hour podcast here and and we would have plenty of material to talk about. All right, well, let's get started. I, well, we both, we were, all three of us came up with top fives. We did some honorable mentions. So I don't want to step on anyone's list, but I just want to talk about the sports movies that came out first this year. I, I read them off to you. So here are the ones that I came up with. We have Any Given Sunday, Varsity Blues, Mystery Alaska, For Love of the Game, Play It to the Bone, Beyond the Mat, the first like inside wrestling documentary that ever came out. And then The Hurricane, which I'm throwing in as a sports movie. Uh, Dean, you said you also came up with your worst movies of the year. Uh, I think The Hurricane should be on that because The Hurricane is fucking terrible. Is it terrible? It's a, I, I thought it's it was a bad, critically acclaimed. It, it was critically acclaimed. It's a bad movie. It's about Denzel Washington. It's about a dude that was uh, thrown in jail like, uh, and he was innocent, right? And he, uh, basically, a boxer lost his career. Is that essentially the plot? Yeah. Uh, Denzel's great in the movie. It, it's just not a good movie. I, I can't speak to it because I have not seen it. I, again, first of all, Beyond the Mat is an excellent pull. That is an amazing – if we're going to do like a top 10 documentaries of all time, I think that's on the board for sure. And for some reason in my research, I, it never crossed my mind, but that is amazing. Uh, with Mankind, uh, with his, his kids watching him basically die out there, the rock hitting him like 10 times in the head of the chair, and his kids had to walk away. Uh, that is an awesome documentary. You don't have to be a wrestling fan to like it. Uh, isn't that, that talks about – wait, no, I was crossing with the Bret Hart Wrestling with Shadows. That's a totally different thing. Two different documentaries, two of the best – wrestling docs of all time but yeah you mentioned play to the bone and i was saying like i i never thought i would talk about play to the bone again for the rest of my life and i was perfectly fine with that but yeah that happened that was a woody harrelson maybe boxing does that sound right i don't know yeah like woody harrelson i believe antonio banderas is the other one in it yeah (laughs) why not (laughs) the best sports movie though you mentioned though if you're not gonna you're gonna throw a doc out it's gotta be a you know, Al Pacino, uh, you know, any given Sunday, right? Is that where we're at, Sammy, as far as the best sports movie in 99? Yeah, absolutely. If you're, if you're not counting Varsity Blues, I think that, I think that any given Sunday is probably objectively a better movie than Varsity Blues, but 
I think Varsity Blues is like one of the most rewatchable movies out there. Like I will watch it anytime it's on from any point, whether you got- What scene specifically or the entire movie? The, the entire movie. I mean, oh. whipped cream scene for sure. But I mean, anything that involves Skeeter, I'm fully in on. I mean, anything that involves like some of those actually legitimately good football scenes from the movie. I mean, I'm, I'm in on it. Yeah. It, the, yeah. The, the entire soundtrack was like ripped off all those weird compilation CDs that I had in the late 90s, too. So I'd be like rocking a Discman and like Foo Fighters on the soundtrack, Green Day on the soundtrack. Like, I know I still remember all the songs that were on the Varsity Blues ACDC, soundtrack. ACDC, baby. That, that's, this is true. Thunderstruck. See, they really went for the wheelhouse of like obvious music of the time, but you know, where that would be a criticism at the time, you're like, oh, they're so topical with these songs. When I'm remembering it 20 years later, it's great because I actually remember these songs. Yeah, I had a varsity blues in like the teen genre, like a teen movie genre. Like as far as honorable mention, I guess we'll give our honorable mention soon enough, but I kind of just grouped it in that. And I thought it was a really good, a really strong year for, for teen movies. And I just threw varsity blues there as well. So I didn't really break it down as far as sports, but now that you bring it out there, uh, Pat, uh, yeah, it's a pretty solid year for sports movies. I mean, the greatest football movie of all time has got to be Rudy, right? I don't, I know it's not the point of this podcast, but as a side note, are we arguing over this or is it, is it Rudy? Is it Mike? Am I on an island there? It's it's not Rudy. Right? I can't stand Rudy. I can't stand Notre Dame. I don't want to hear about their propaganda. It's it's ludicrous to begin with. I think he was outside. I would say the best. <laughs> the best. You gotta fo- throw the flag on the kid. <laughs> I- I did a best football movies podcast. I think we came up with any given Sunday at one. I think I had varsity blues at number two though. What was the program last or second last? <laughs> it, it was, it was inside the top 10. There just aren't that many football movies. I'm but actually, in on, I'm, I'm actually in on the program. So I just want to know like where the consensus is. <laughs> I just wanted to go on a, on a rant about little giants because I, 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 I was uh, for no particular reason that this happened. I had a conversation. So little giants, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but they're, they're down like a touchdown or so. They're on their own one yard line, like five seconds to go. They have to go 99 yards and little giants. And then they did the, uh, the annexation of Puerto Rico. I don't care what kind of play, how cute the name is. You, what kind of, what kind of, you know, coaches worth in salt, put half your players on the other side of the field. They did a trick play. I don't know why I'm going up in this tangent the other day, but what I'm saying is the annexation of Puerto Rico is a fraud. That movie is ridiculous, and uh, Ed O'Neill is the worst football coach of all time because you just can't allow it to happen. 99 yard touchdown to one second to go. That's it. But well, so, I mean, I, Little Giants was on that list. Uh, but again, there's only so there, there's only so many football movies. But then, like, Sammy, what's your problem with the program? Because I had the replacements really high because I just really enjoy the replacements. But I don't hate I don't hate the program like people seem to hate the program. No, I, I actually like the program, and I think the I, I just think it's bad. But I think the program like actually deals with some things that we're still worrying about today it's actually aged all right just in terms of like you know the steroid use and you know all the stuff that comes along with being a college athlete I think it was not taken seriously at the time but I think that's like real stuff and uh it just didn't come out as like a super legitimate movie but I think it touches on some issues that are that are actually pretty fresh in well, Dean, you mentioned you threw Varsity Blues into the teen movie genre for this year. And there's, uh, you, yeah. you said there's a bunch of them, like American Pie, 10 Things I Hate About You, Cruel Intentions, Varsity Blues. I think Jawbreaker. She's all that. She's all that. I think Jawbreaker came out this year, too. Do you have a preference for those? Because I think that everyone nostalgically <laughs> is just prone to American Pie. I think I am, too. That's literally my list. American Pie, Jawbreaker, uh, which is one of those that kind of gets lost in the shuffle, but pretty fun to watch. Ten Things I Hate, uh, hate About You didn't really take for me, but I know it's pretty popular. Uh, Varsity Boozy talked about She's All That. Like, truth in marketing, she definitely was all that. Uh, you know, some movies, they had misleading titles, like Banger Sisters, I'm Looking at You, Goldie Hawn, and Susan Sarandon. Uh, but she's, she is delightful. Of course, you, you have to get past the preposterous. Uh, okay, so the premise is that the, this dude's making a bet, and the, basically the bet is, you can't turn any random girl. I'm going to select the girl, uh, and then you cannot turn her in the homecoming queen. Who picks the girl that's clearly good looking, but she's wearing a spot, not a lot of makeup and glasses, and her hair is up or something? Well, the, out of like 400, 500, 600 girls, she's the chalk. That's the one we're going to is when it's like the most difficult to turn the uh, homecoming queen. Ridiculous. Preposterous. That said, perfectly fine team movie. I, is that the one at the end where like Usher's the DJ and they're all dancing to Rockefeller Skank? That's right. <laughs> I, I, I'm remembering that That's right? right. Usher, Usher is definitely the DJ, and we have to we have to like make sure that we know that it's Freddie Prince Jr. And there was this entire Freddie Prince Jr. phase here, which it's really unclear why there was a phase. Summer catch. All that was like right in the middle of it. 
<laughs> well, Freddie, I don't know like what ha- like I, I have no idea what happened to Freddie Prince. You did those Scooby Doo movies. Maybe he's just living off of Scooby money uh, from this point forward. I'll but, tell like, you this: I, I'm going to guarantee. I don't know this for a fact, but ha- Freddie Prince Jr. and Matthew Lillard had the same agent, and his agent in every, every conversation ended with, "You want Freddie Prince? You got to throw in Matthew Lillard too. That's it. That's final. I'm hanging up." Well, like, did you, well, he was he, in every movie with Freddie Prince. He was. Well, Freddie Prince was also in Fever Pitch, and he like couldn't throw a baseball, and I, that may have ruined his career. But like Matthew Lillard resurfaced last year on Twin Peaks of all places, and he was like shockingly good, as was, he should. As that he was should. Summer Catch. That was called Fever Pitch. Oh yeah, and it's Summer Catch. There's another one. Is Fever Pitch the one with like Jimmy Fallon? Yes. Yeah. The one where he it's the, the, yeah, yeah. The with Drew, Drew Barrymore. Yeah. Dude, it, it is hard to overstate how good Matthew Lillard was in Scream. I mean, <laughs> he made that movie into a straight classic and I'm actually really disappointed. Like more things did not happen for him as time went on. Well, it also sucked that like spoiler alert for Scream 2 that like he really got the short end of the stick. He just got the, uh, no, was it him? No, I'm, I'm, now I'm getting him confused with Jamie Kennedy. There, this is all just coming back to me all at once as a flood of like half memories of what happened in these years, in these movies. Yeah, I mean, Stifler went on and had a better career than, uh, what's his name? John Paul, John, I don't know. But Stifler did better than, uh, than, than he did as time went on. I, don't, I think that's the travesty. No, Stifler is great. Like, Stifler is probably one of my favorite actors of all time. I will, like, as I, I mentioned to you, I saw Universal Soldier 2, The Return, just because Goldberg was in it. I also saw, like, I also saw, like, Highlander 4 because Edge was in it. Because I was very big into wrestling at the time. Uh, wrestling was also legit in 1999. But, like, I followed Stifler to, like, he did those movies with The Rock. He did uh, The Rundown. With The Rock, it had him, like Rosario Dawson and Christopher Walken. Shockingly good movie. I've already mentioned Southland Tales. Stifler's a big part of that. Goon is a fantastic movie. Like, he's really he's stayed the course of time. Role Models is fantastic. All right, what's his real name? Sean William Scott. Sean William Scott. Sean Michael Scott, okay. <laughs> he's not Sean. Yeah, he's a mix between Sean Michaels and Stifler. That, that's what he's going to go with. <laughs> So of all those, would you throw in, so we went through like the, the teen movies, is like Detroit Rock City a teen movie? Because I've seen that movie a bunch of times. I th- yeah, it's just they go to see Kiss, right? That's basically the premise of the movie. Yeah. It's a couple teenagers go to see Kiss. But by the way, just to tie it all in, you, you're speaking of wrestling, you're speaking of Freddie Prince Jr. Freddie Prince Jr. was a, re- a writer for WWE for a couple of years. What? He was not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fire up the Google. I refuse to believe that. That doesn't sound. Uh, that, that, that doesn't sound that real. Preposterous. It doesn't seem real. <laughs> but it seems so ridiculous that why would I make that up? There's Dude, a- D, D, you're the MVP of this pod already. I can't believe you came out with this nugget. <laughs> so the, the other two like teen movies that I throw on the list, they kind of made my honorable mention section. But we'll throw them right now because they didn't crack my top five. One of them came in at number six, but did not crack the top five. Uh, Election, I guess, is a teen movie, but. It's just a really good movie, so that stuff. And then Go is, so I guess it's like a young adult movie, but I love the movie Go. Dude, Go is awesome. And as somebody who was taking a lot of ecstasy at the time, <laughs> uh, I mean, I was just like fully in on this. Like the, the rave scene at this point in time was getting really big. And so to like have that and then have the guys from like 90210 in it, uh, Timothy Oliphant with his ridiculous hair. I mean, I, I think Go is super fun. And it's, it's weird because it, it's Doug Lyman's follow-up to Swingers. So when you went to these raves and people were selling you ecstasy, did they try to convince you, you what you want to do is smoke all this pot first and then take this not ecstasy pill? <laughs> they didn't have to do any convincing, mate. It was just, <laughs> it was happening. It sells itself. There's no fix necessary. Yeah. I never dabble. It's too late now at this point, right? Now there's nothing you rebel against. I can't, I missed the boat. Is that your, do you recommend it for the kids or? No, I yeah, recommend. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Dean. Like, there's never, I guess there's never a good time or bad time if you want to get into it. And now you got your MDMA, you can have it in your mall, you're, you'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, you want the pure stuff. You don't want to cut with all the speed and everything. That's where you're getting in trouble. You said 90210. Do you not mean a party of five, Scott Wolf? Oh yeah, no, no, no. I mean, uh, didn't they? Didn't they have a uh, Ian Ziering and uh... Ian Ziering wasn't in Go? No, it was, was it? it was it was Jay Moore and Scott Wolf. So yeah, you're right. Party of Five. Oh, dude, I'm I'm a uh, I'm I'm dating myself. I, You're I thinking of Sharknado. I think that's what that's on my brain. <laughs> so it, it, like the, the cast for this movie is shockingly good. Even like William Fincher's in it in just a weird pyramid scheme type stuff where he's like the FBI agent, but he's also trying to solve them like Amway. Like it's, yes. it, the movie is off the charts good. 
Well, if somebody watched Pulp Fiction and said, let's do that, like a, like a cooler, like hipper, like electronic fused uh, version. It's it's fixed, you know, Pulp Fiction, Quentin Tarantino ask actually is an article. That, that was my original thought that I was reading the, uh, it's actually in the article there in the ringer. They, they said Tarantino ask. It's pretty fair to say that it's inspired by Tarantino to some extent. Not not as clever, obviously, but good. Yeah, yeah but like that non-linear, like jump back and forth, like, and they had so many things happen yeah, from like people's different angles. And it was really funny to see it like the second and third time from a different uh, perspective. I really liked it. So oh, it wasn't a, uh, was it Katie, Katie Holmes in it? Katie yeah. Holmes, the like, that, that was like, that was like her, her prime years, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, Katie Holmes, Sarah Paul. You mentioned like Oliphant. Oliphant is like the weird drug dealer in it who ends up with Katie Holmes. Spoiler alert. I, I definitely wanted to be Timothy Oliphant after I saw that movie. <laughs> Was there a thing? Is that was he in the free slim? Is that what we're referencing here? Is that him? Maybe. Am I crossing movies? I don't recall. But if, you know what's weird? It's like some movies that like the hat this night on. You don't randomly see like you don't turn on Showtime or HBO, right? Why what happened to go? Like, why does it not randomly appear on our TVs? Like now you'll see Shaw Trick Redemption every eight minutes, just kind of flip through it's on every third channel. How do these some some movies we just kind of get lost? And like well, Three Kings, another movie from 1999, really good movie. You just never see it. Yeah. What happened to him? Well, let, 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 let's let's not step on three kings because that might come up in one of oh. our top five rankings. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, it does, I, I have an affinity for Ice Cube, so what, what can I say? Um, How could you not? Uh, and it's also a big Spike Jones year too, because he's in that and he directed being John Malkovich, which also like. <laughs> Like the list Amazing of good movie. Amazing the, movie. Like, and that doesn't even like sniff my top ten, and that movie rules. Yes, same, same. They, they, they got an honorable really mention for me, but like couldn't make top five. But I just think that movie is like so hilarious. How do you describe that movie to somebody that's never seen it before? Just give me like what's like the, the blurb on the TV? Like, what does it say? Give, give me the three sentence summary of being John Malkovich. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, but uh, I, I would rewatch the sex scenes from being John Malkovich right now. <laughs> really, really, really good voyeuristic uh, footage right there. All right, it's a wild movie. So, uh, Dean, you did you did hit on the worst movies of the year. So, g- give me a few of the ones that you were throwing. I'll throw out the Hurricane, like I said, uh, and the movie Ravenous, which I saw. Uh, not good. Not not a great. Movie. What is Ravenous? I'm not aware of Ravenous. Uh, Ravenous has Guy Pierce and it was Robert Carlyle coming off of Full Monty and they're in like some sort of Nordic setting and they like eat each other for like power. None of this sounds good. No. Yeah, yeah, not not great flick. <laughs> I had Inspector Gadget like Matthew Broderick trying to ruin my childhood. What are you doing, Matthew Broderick? Uh, baby geniuses? Seriously? I mean, I understand like, you know. <laughs> but no, I, I'm not buying that one. Wild Wild West and Will Smith. Shame on you, Will Smith, with the money grab. Yeah, but, that was that was that was bad. I was actually saying before the show, uh, I was telling Pat that he should get Tim Anderson's top five, <laughs> and that Wild Wild West would be number one on his. Oh, like he would like it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He just, like, just he like, trade. Yeah, he just said whatever the worst possible thing is, that's what he's going to be all in on. But the crazy thing yes, is that Wild Will Smith, Wild West, number one for Andrew Cust. Will, Will Smith decided to do Wild Wild West over being Neo, which is just nuts. That's right. Yeah, that was the decision, wasn't it? Oh, what a disaster job. choice. Yeah, not not a great decision. So I guess I'm the youngest one on here. So how did Cruel Intentions hit you, Sammy? Because you're, you know, you're very close in age. Well, what was that like for your child? Like, how old were you in 1999? Uh, I was 19 and I mean, Cruel Intentions was like, I I loved it because A, we had the iconic kiss, which was a big moment for all of us. Remember, internet porn was not really around. Like the internet was just kind of starting. So having that kiss was like a really big deal. And, uh, you know, it had it had all the 90s songs in there. You know, I mean, it it just had all the people like Ryan Phillippe in there. Um, I mean, it was, it was a great movie. I loved it. And and it it really capitalized on all of the not internet porn that was going on and all the hype that was around wild things the year before when Denise Richards and Ned Campbell were making out in the pool. So I like that, that, that was the move at that time. Just put some, like some hot sexual tension in a movie. You're going to get everyone between the ages of 10 and 40 to go see it. That that is, that is correct. And it was, you know, uh, definitely the, the height of Sarah Michelle Gellar at her most hot. So, I mean, you, you have to give bonus points for that. Do you, do you have any specific recollections, Dean, about when Cruel Intentions came out? 
I do. I remember exactly when it came out because it played at my college. You know, we, you know, it, it was that that dates myself too, I suppose. But uh, yeah, and I remember who I went and saw it with and watched it and thoroughly enjoyed it. And of course, the, the kiss you're talking about is uh, was it Sarah Michelle Gellar and uh, and Selma Blair. Selma Blair, correctly. yeah. Yeah, and of course, Reese Witherspoon was lurking as well too. Yeah, Selma uh, Blair's character in this movie is absolutely ridiculous. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> like, you were watching you're like what the fuck is going on with this chick like <laughs> and like it also melded at the time like one of my favorite bands counting crows i think that they played well there's two great songs right the counting crow song the uh colorblind was playing during the uh, the scene with the escalator i believe and the other yeah. song was the verb or the verb plight hype was it the verb one of the verbs it was it was one of a bittersweet symphony there you go yeah that, 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 was, I mean, that was like the soundtrack of the year was it not yeah, it was it was really classic, like great use of a song. Can, can I can, can I throw out that I hate the Counting Crows and Mr. Jones is the most just uh, it, it's the most horrible song to hear anywhere, whether it's on the radio, whether you go to see like a live band play it. It's just insufferable. So I'm actually with you. So one of my big uh, my big qualms with the movie Rounders is that they finish it with a Counting Crows song, which I absolutely hate. And it's just like, it doesn't fit with the flow of the movie. And I hate the song. And I'm just like, dude, that is the one thing about Rounders that I'd change. So I'm actually on board with you. I've, I've listened to August and everything after probably more than almost any other CD in my entire life. So I will just, I will uh, politely disagree. I will say Mr. Jones is probably not the best way to grade that band. And I will also say that they progressively really, they fell off the table. They're like Chris Davis, modern day Chris Davis. As far as what, what they're doing. It's a... Uh, I, I'm not on board with their recent stuff, but uh, I'm a big fan of Counting Crows. I will, I will stand by it. All right. So right. Uh, other bad movies. I don't even know if this is a bad movie. It's just the one of the weirdest movies. Because So I guess if you were 19 in 1999, I was 14 in 19. I was, yeah, I was 14 in 1999. Like, I saw 8mm in the theaters, and like I should not have seen that movie in the theaters. It's about snuff. It was a it's, about porn, snuff right? it's about snuff films. Oh. Yeah, Nick Cage. I mean, he's never said he'll do anything. Yeah, he, he doesn't even read. Yeah, whatever. I'll sign. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> Why not? I'm available. Do, do, I, like, Sammy, do you remember any of like the really crappy movies from that year? Besides, like, I think Wild Wild West is the biggest example of it. Yeah, Wild Wild West is the worst. Uh, I might catch some flack for this, but I think uh, I think Ghost Dog: The Way of the Samurai. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> My pot, yeah, I mean, people are going to be like, what? <laughs> Forrest Whitaker is not happy. No, no. I mean, and he's not happy in that entire movie. So, um, so, so yeah, uh, Runaway Bride, probably really bad. <laughs> the, the, there, are, there, are, there are two that I'm going to throw out here. Uh, one. I got the hammer. I'll see whatever you say and raise it, but you go ahead. Uh, all right. So uh, one is Stuart Little, which is just terrible. <laughs> Great, great yeah, acting. Great, great acting from Stewart. I mean, it was just fantastic stuff from that mouse. But like, I don't think the Green Mile is very good. Like, it's a shockingly bad movie, and people like to think it's really good because oh, it's nominated very for Picture of the Year. I know, and like, we'll talk about the Oscars here. Not a great look for the Oscars in 1999, considering how Awful many look. good movies that there are. Awful look. But yeah, Green I Mile. I can't stand and- it. Well, wait a second. Was American History X ninety nine as well too? Did I miss this in my research? No, that's ninety eight, no. isn't it? Look at look for the two thousand Oscars. Dean, yeah. Okay, I'll be mean, year behind or year ahead. I got gotcha. you. Never mind. Go ahead. I apologize. All right. Yeah. So so let's talk about the Oscars that year because American Beauty wins Best Picture, which people loved when it came out and thought it was like a revelation and it has not aged well over 20 years, but it's now to the point where like people hate it. Cause Kevin Spacey's in it. No one wants anything to do with Kevin Spacey. That's fine. I, I get that. Correct. But the movie Correct. confirmed, but, confirmed predatory bad person, but, but like there are, there are parts of this movie that are really good. Like the whole subplot with his wife and the King, the, the dad from the OC, Peter Gallagher is just fantastic. So, so I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little bit of preview. I actually put this in my top five. Oh, okay. And I completely agree. Yeah. I completely agree that it has gotten a lot of hate because of Kevin Spacey. Um, and it's gotten a lot of heat because it won picture of the year and it shouldn't have, it was not the picture of the year. Uh, but I think it like really captures this mood of like being a suburban schmuck and like blinking and all of a sudden you're 45 and you're in a loveless marriage in a job you hate and it's like how on earth did i get here and what's going on with my life and i think that really hits close to home for a lot of people like a lot of people are either in that mode or they're really scared 
of being in that place in life like me. Like I think about this constantly, like, please do not let this happen to me. Um, and, you know, it's really about a man having a midlife crisis and a legitimate one. And I actually think it's really good. It just shouldn't have been picture of the year. Probably well, shouldn't have been nominated. The It's funny because like Alan Ball would go on to do Six Feet Under like very shortly after this. And then he ended up uh, just basically devolving into camp by doing what the hell was the name of that vampire show we did for HBO with Anna Paquin. Uh, oh, so bad. Uh, True Blood? True yes. Blood. Yes, yes, yes. My, my wife loved True Blood to no end. But I feel like Ryan Murphy really came in and stepped on Alan Ball's corner when it all was said and done for like camp plus all this weird stuff that would go on in movies. But there may be no truer line than the very beginning of American Beauty when Kevin Spacey is doing his like over narrations like, yeah, in so and so, whatever, I'll be dead. And it cuts to him and he's beaten off in the shower. It's like, Beaten off in the shower, the highlight of my day. Like that, <laughs> that, that really sets the tone for the movie. <laughs> good, good year for Mina Savari too. American Beauty and American Pie. What, hap I, uh, what happened to Mina Savari? Uh, they found out she actually wasn't a good actress. Yeah, I can see that. Which was her only problem. So the other like big like Oscar movies this, that year, like I'm just trying to find where's Best Picture at because. Eh, best actor. No, I should probably type in best picture. Yeah, so best picture, Cider House Rules, Green Mile, The Insider, The Sixth Sense, and American Beauty. Okay, so if we were to re-legislate the Oscars with the nominees that are up, uh, do we all agree that The Insider is by far the best of these movies? Yes. Yeah, this is, I mean, a really underrated Michael Mann movie. I mean, Michael Mann, like, was doing work at this time. And I think The Insider was really good, but I it, it wouldn't be my picture of the year. Like, if we we're re-legislating the nominees... I think The Matrix is in there. Fight Club is in there. Magnolia possibly in there. I, I I don't think a lot of these movies even make it. Yeah, like six six. Like, is The Sixth Sense a good movie, or is it a good movie for how it was rolled out? Like the experience that you got with it in 1999. The second one. Like, is I, I've never I've never gone back to rewatch it, Dean. Like, I have no idea how it holds up. Yeah, I mean, I'm just, it's probably not as ways it's not as clever the second time around. But uh, you, know, you know what it is? You can watch it twice because the second time, once you know the twist, you can kind of see all the clues. It's sort of like, oh, yeah, I guess I could have picked up on that. I guess I could have picked up on that. Yeah. yeah, but the third time, you can't watch it anymore the three times, I suppose. Uh, you know, we talked about this kind of spot. This whole conversation spawned out of the ringer. And, you know, Bill Simmons on his podcast years ago gave the premise this will never happen because we like immediacy. But the premise was basically let's vote on the Oscars like three years after the movie has been around and kind of in the world and in pop culture and see what kind of effect it has and how much that would change the voting. Like we should vote for the uh, best movie of, of 2016 and 2019. And then it kind of ferments and we sort of know like, okay, maybe we're not prisoner, prisoner, prisoners on the moment kind of thing. And uh, then we would have a different cider house rules would not be on here. Green Mile would not be on here. Uh, American Beauty, by the way, we'll, we'll get to our top five soon enough, obviously, but I, I'm with Sammy. It's in my top five and I, yes. I knocked it down. It was in my top five movies of all time. I yes, love Dean. I, I oh, love American Beauty. I'm, I'm so I'm so happy with you. I thought this would be like a contrarian take, and I was like kind of kind of scared, but I had to go with it. I, I had a friend of mine who uh, recommended to me in college, and he, he insisted I go see it so much so he said, "Listen," and this person's kind of frugal. He goes, "I will give you money money back guaranteed. I will, you go see this movie. I guarantee you're going to love it. If you don't love it, I will, I will reimburse you. No questions asked. I will I will give you money plus your time." And I'm like. Okay, sold. And uh, I, it was a great sales pitch, and I, did, I was not that guy where I pretended to not like it and to get eight bucks. <laughs> that wasn't a rich college kid, but couldn't be that guy. Um, yeah, it, it's an amazing. The way Sandy kind of summarized it up, it's, uh, it's just an awesome movie. But like, yeah, I, I think I kind of knocked it down a little bit just because of Kevin Spacey. Because you know, you, Pat, you said that we didn't age well. It didn't age well, like not through no fault of its own. Well, also there's a kind of sort of like you know him ogling over like a seventeen year old's kind of creepy too. But uh, besides that, yeah, it's a little borderline. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like, I, I think there's like the, the whole stuff, like I, I know it's a driving force of the movie, but like the entire neighbor subplot, like with Chris Cooper, what the hell is the other guy's name who like fell off the face of the earth? He was in that movie Four Feathers with Heath Ledger and he was also terrible in that, in that like that whole. Are you talking about the kid? Yeah, with, the kid, who, the kid with the video the plastic bag. Yeah, like yeah. The, the, that, that whole part, I feel like has not been done a service to this movie over the years like it's just not good yeah 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 the the homophobic neighbor the like it was yeah it turned out bad yeah so wes something wes bentley maybe his name is that sounds right yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, I haven't heard much from old Wes Bentley lately. Uh, so maybe at the end, because I... You know, uh, little known fact, Wes Bentley, currently he's a writer for WWE. I, I, yeah. You wouldn't believe <laughs> I so, that one up. So my, my favorite my favorite line for him is when he's offering weed to Kevin Spacey. They're like puffing, you know, outside uh, that one event. And he goes, yeah. Or And then Spacey comes over to his house and he goes, okay, I have this. It's good. It's the regular stuff. And then I have whatever the G13. And he goes, uh, is that what we smoked the other night? And he goes, that's all I smoke. <laughs> <laughs> Gangster. I just love that Kevin Spacey was like, so uh, he admired that kid. He just, he told his boss to go fuck off and, Kevin Spacey is like, whoa, you could do that? <laughs> like, <laughs> like he just this whole like, you know, because he had this whole like, uh, uh, you know, he has nothing to lose mentality, basically. It's right. Like, and that's like at the part of the movie is that Kevin Spacey, the big thing for him in his midlife crisis is that, is that he's lost who he used to be. Right. And I think so many times, at least in my life, I'm like, gosh, you know, I'm so different than I was 15 years ago. Have I lost like these parts of me along the way? And you don't want to. And I think Kevin Spacey, like a big part of his transformation is like rediscovering that. And I think there's a lot of, I don't know, I, I just think it's kind of a interesting and cool journey for him. And, and that's the part of the movie I like the most. So we'll maybe, because I think that we agree that if we try to re-legislate what the Oscars should have been for this year, if we do that at the end, that's not going to conflict with their top five list because there's movies that I would probably say, hey, this is a movie I just really like. I don't think it deserves to be like a best picture. We can have two separate discussions about that, can't we? For sure, for sure. I'm okay with liking bad movies. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, box office that year, do you know what the number, the, did you look at the box office at all from 1999 to see what came out number one? No. Dean, did you? I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess the Matrix. Maybe it was the Green Mile, or was it South Park? Okay, so the top ten I'm for the year. South Park. They're, they're, Star Wars Episode One actually oh, came out in 1999. Oh, of course, yeah. It, yeah, it, yeah. it made 430 million dollars. The Sixth Sense was second. Toy Story Two. Austin Powers Two, which made over 200 yeah, million dollars. Then The Matrix. Then Tarzan. Uh, Big Daddy was number seven. I totally forgot about Big Daddy, The Mummy, Runaway Bride, and The Blair Witch Project, number 10. So The Blair Witch Project is the one that kind of popped in the semi honorable mention, and it's weird because uh, it's just so groundbreaking. If you if you watch it with 2019 eyes, it's the most like underwhelming, like, you're, well, why was this a big deal? Well, you got to understand, you got to put it into context, this happened in 1999, where people didn't fully understand how the internet worked, and didn't, it was kind of a dark space to some degree, and people were kind of learning how to manipulate it, and it was the first movie to ever really use uh, internet or marketing to their favor. Uh, basically, they convinced people that this was like found footage of three people that got murdered in the woods. And all of a sudden, they're just going to show it in the theaters. Like, yes. that's what people believe. Uh, and by the way, this was, you know, I went to UCF, University of Central Florida. This is before they were the national championships. This was back in 99. But um, I, uh, you know, I was bombarded by it because this movie was created by students from UCF. So you couldn't get away from it. I went to the theaters and it was sold out and I ended up having to sit on the seats. I stuck in the watch Blair Witch Project. And it's like not like a really good movie, but I think just for its legacy of the marketing of it, uh, it cost $60,000, made like what, 250 million or so, give or take. And again, super, super underwhelming movie if you watch it through that 2019 eyes, but uh, just sort of like the groundwork it laid as, as far as how to market a movie. And also like dollar for dollar, like, you know, ROI, it's in the top five, top 10 all time as far as money made as well. Uh, all movies, not just this year. Uh, again, not good, but just interesting. And, uh, you know, it's historic for, I guess, the legacy it leaves. I mean, think of, think of all, think of the legacy that it left and like all these found footage movies, like that trope really became like, you know, paranormal activity and all that stuff. Like it really developed a, an entire genre. And I actually put this on my list, not oh. because it's good now, because it was so good and important then. Um, it was just, it's one of those movies, the more you watch it, the worse it is. Yeah. I mean, it is, <laughs> it is people bad. believe this was real. Like people were convinced that this actually happened. Yeah. I mean, when, it, it's like a scary campfire story come to life. And the first time I watched it, it did have the hairs on the back of my neck, like standing up. I really thought there was like some legitimate freakiness to it. You talked about the marketing, uh, you know, the, the found footage, all this stuff. It kind of went viral before viral was viral. I mean, it was really, really unique and cool. And I think if you're exactly right, if you look at it through 1999 eyes, this was one of the most important movies of that year. And it was just really unique at a time when uniqueness, uh, there's not a lot of it anymore. 
I, I can tell you that through the 1999 eyes, like I mentioned, I was 14. No movie has ever scared the shit out of me more in a movie theater. Like I was fucking yeah, freaked dude. the entire time. Well, well, get this. I shit you not, Pat. <laughs> a week later, me and two buddies, me and two friends went camping and it was me uh, and another guy and a girl. And we went camping and I've never been so scared on a camping trip. I, after we'd seen this, it was just like completely freak out. All right. So uh, besides all those, there's a lot of like, before we get into like guilty pleasures and maybe stuff that just missed the list, there's movies with like big name talent in it that just didn't do well. Like end of days came out this year. I feel like that's the last big Arnold movie that they tried to like think was going to be this huge gigantic thing. And it just wasn't, it was kind of like the end of Arnold. Thank God. Yeah, this is not my wheelhouse. Like, I never sought it out. I'm not a big action guy, so it's just kind of – I had no interest. I never saw it. I, I imagine it's not good. And whatever, Arnold, congr- it's a great American story. Congratulations to him to what, what he accomplished. It's a completely absurd Wikipedia page. Like, you wouldn't believe it if you weren't aware of it. But uh, he's just not for me. Like, what he does is not – you know, whatever. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm fully okay throwing out all Arnold except for the Terminators. Like, oh, how, he, how, he, how dare you besmirch true lies? One of the greatest movies oh, of all time. Okay, okay, okay. You're right. You're right. You're absolutely right about this. Batman and Robin, Mr. Freeze. No, not so much. <laughs> so, like, there's there's a few there's a few other ones. You got like Ended Days. Like Denzel is in the movie called The Bone Collector, which I don't recall ever seeing. Uh, uh, is Payback directed by John Woo? But Ben Affleck's in it. Is it a John Woo movie? No, no, no. I I'm, thought Payback was Mel Gibson, no? It, it is. It is Mel Gibson that came out there. I think yeah, it, with, I think uh, it with, Paycheck. With Porter. Yeah, that's right. Porter. <laughs> Another so, guy I can't watch in 2019, Mel Gibson. That's a whole other conversation, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, Mel Gibson's best work is usually behind the camera. Like, people didn't have a problem with Hacksaw Ridge. Like, even behind me, if I just, like, swerve this way a little bit, I have an Apocalypto poster on the wall behind me. Like, Apocalypto is one of my favorite 10 movies of the 2000s. So, I can't hate on Mel that much for the movie part. I don't want to see him in movies. Bra- but- Braveheart will endure. Braveheart will endure. And Payback is the closet really, really great. Like, the entire just cinematography of that movie, the, like, grayscale they do the whole time, like... The absurdity, like the gangsterness of Porter. I like the whole thing, man. Did Payback lay the groundwork for John Wick? Is that basically the same concept? Possibly. And I legit just watched John Wick last night. <laughs> we it was we on TV and my wife like won't watch it because the dog gets killed. She's like, no, I won't watch it. <laughs> the, uh, like, we we also ahead. we we also had like Sean Connery in Entrapment that year with Catherine Zeta Jones, which is Oh, just with the ludicrous. ass shot. Yeah. yeah. So that came out, Double Jeopardy with Ashley Judd. When I was going over this, my wife was like, I love Double Jeopardy. Like, I'm pretty sure that movie's terrible. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> I think it's terrible. I can confirm. Yeah. <laughs> so there's just a lot of that stuff. And The World Is Not Enough, the Bond movie that came out, which is also quite poor. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of out on most Bond movies that were made after like 1985. Oh, you don't like Yeah, the- I'm out on Bond. Oh, come on. The, the Dalton movies were all right. I just, again, it just not, this is not my genre. It's not my wheelhouse. If you enjoy it, but I, I'm not, you know, just as a general rule, action movies, it's just not for me. I'll nope. play some Bond Goldeneye, though. I was all into that. <laughs> that was 1999 right there. Uh, also, I, I mean, I know it's, again, that, that's also on the wall behind me. I think it's right there. Yeah. So I do have Goldeneye. Goldeneye, sneaky bad game. Yes. Did not age well after like perfect dark and halo and all that. Yeah. But like, even like the the game of golden Knight itself, like the actual, like go through all the levels is fucking horrendous. Like the only redeeming part of the game is playing the multiplayer. Well, yeah. I mean, that's all you did, right? That that was the important part in a, you know, in college we had like bond tournaments. So, I mean, I just have a real. Who was the guy? Lockjaw? Was there one guy that just never lost because he's like too small or something like that? Oh, Oh, yeah. Uh, The the short, fat guy that they that they lampooned in Austin Powers. Yeah, so you had a cheat code. You you had like Odd Job as a guy who was too short, but then you also had Jaws was the guy who was too big. So you'd make the best guy be Jaws, the worst guy be Odd Job. It was like an equalizer. What? Did I call him Lockjaw? Is that what I call him? You didn't call him Lockjaw. That's fantastic. (laughs) There was also that thing where you could like memorize the like respawning points. Yeah, you could kill somebody. 
and then roll right to the respawn and then shoot them the moment they came alive again, which was real cheap, but also real awesome. Yeah, like, <laughs> it, like it, if you played in the facility, you could fit you like, and you played it enough times, you knew what the pattern of respawning was. So the only time that you could get away with not being dead is if you respawn in that like very back corridor. But there'd be like a yeah. three, there'd be a three spawn cycle where it'd be like, you'd be in the one room, you'd end up in the vent. And if you were in the vent, you were fucking toast. You might as well just stay there. <laughs> the time. And you then you'd go out and commit suicide. <laughs> yeah, and then you would just respawn. Like, after you got killed in the vent, you would respawn in the room that was right below the vent and then you just go pop them off there then you got to go into the back and maybe you got a gun but like yeah it wasn't a great game <laughs> pat was in on golden eye this is great oh you had to be listen if you're gonna play enough golden eye you had to be good at it yeah and it was probably the best it wasn't the best multiplayer game of its like generation because like mario kart was out at the time, but like multiplayer Mario Kart sucked unless you were actually racing. Like the battle one was just horrible. Yeah, yeah, that was kind of like a like a straight melee. One on one was it was okay, but Doom like five years earlier maybe right? Sure, 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 sure. Doom? I was all right with it. Yeah. Could you play Doom multiplayer though? Yeah, I believe so. That's, I remember doing that like in high school or something like that. Oh, yeah. I'm thinking of Duke I Nukem. I just remember playing Duke Nukem and hitting the space bar at the strippers to throw money at them so they'd show you your tits when I was like nine. A totally different game than what I was playing in high school. <laughs> that does not sound familiar, but or maybe I missed out. I don't know. All right, let's get to some guilty pleasures here, stuff that probably didn't make the list. Uh, there's one movie. I, I mean, The Mummy I've seen a bunch of times, and I will watch it anytime it's on, but... Blue Streak came out this year with Luke Wilson and Martin Lawrence. And I may have seen this movie like 60 times. It was always on TBS when I was growing up. <laughs> Sammy, this one's, I don't have any Blue Streak takes. <laughs> no Blue Streak takes. <laughs> I have not thought about this movie. <laughs> I have no clue. Where's Martin Lawrence? Generally, generally, I'm not on Martin Lawrence. Like, <laughs> Martin Lawrence can suck it for me. But you know what? Guilty pleasure? I'm all right with the bet. All right, do you have, like, like I have a whole bunch of them. Like, I'm a big fan of uh, Galaxy Quest. I love Mystery Men with Ben Stiller. Like, that's a fantastic cast. Really stupid movie, but a fantastic cast. Like, uh, Arlington Road with Tim Robbins came out. Oh, yeah. I, I was, yeah. That I was, may or may not be on somebody's top five. Okay, well, we'll save that one then. Uh, Bowfinger. I love Bowfinger, like, to the nth degree. And then, like, Detroit Rock City, which I mentioned. Then Lockstock. You talk about, like, the Tarantino influence on oh, Go. Bro. Lockstock comes out and sets, like, Guy Ritchie's career off, but it's British Tarantino stuff. Yeah, I almost put Lockstock in my top five. It was very close for me because it's just, like, you know, it's kind of – it was it, it came out before Snatch, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it was just, like, you know, almost the same cast but not. And so I think most people saw Snatch first because that was the big deal. And then you go back and see Lock Stock and you're like, dude, this might be just as good. It was really good. And just like fun, like British gangster shit. Like I love, love Lock Stock. I, I couldn't understand it. I, and at the time I didn't have the function ability to put captions on my TV, or at least I wasn't uh, clever enough or savvy <laughs> enough to do so. I tried watching it and I couldn't understand it. I'm like, that's it. I'm tapping out. <laughs> it could be great for all I know, but I could not understand the accents. That's it. it. it I, I claim ignorance this one. It, it didn't make it up to like, I, I was starting to think about it like in context of, do I want to put this in my top five, my top 10, my top 15? It just boiled down to like, I like Snatch better. And I did. You were right. Yeah. I saw it first. Then I went back and like rent it. I went to Blockbuster and got Lockstock and watched it after. And I've, Snatch is just so much better made. Lockstock might be a better movie, but there's yeah. just the production quality and the acting and everything else in Snatch is just so much better. This is this is kind of I might be stepping on one you know one or both of your lists, but it's kind of how I felt about Magnolia, where yeah. I think it's a really good movie, but it's not the best Paul Thomas Anderson movie by any stretch. And so that you know, I was kind of comparing it against his other movies as opposed to the movies this year. It's not fair though, and we'll talk about that, but that's not fair. It's not, it's but not. I, I went through the same thing with Magnolia, too, because I like Magnolia a lot. I've seen it a bunch of times. It didn't crack my top five, and I love like, – there's the – like, in the pantheon of Paul Thomas Anderson movies, it's one of the worst, which it's is – It's Dean's number one, dude. We're, we're shitting on him. It's not my number one, but it's on the – you guys are slowly knocking out my family food board. <laughs> it's, it's there. You know, it's – I, I – Paul Thomas Anderson, he's on the Mount Rushmore of directors for me, and, like, we can run through, you know, Boogie Nights, There Will Be Blood, Punch Drunk Love, Hard Eight, The Master – like, it's just a ridiculous resume. 
Yes. Um, and yeah, I, I agree. Magnolia is not his best. By the way, side note, Boogie Nights, spoiler alert, that's his best movie. Clearly his best. Boogie Nights for well, me is a top 10 movie ever. I see. Boogie Nights is probably, I would say, yeah, I was gonna say it's in my top five favorite movies ever, but the more and more like as time has gone on, I've seen Boogie Nights, like there's no part that I can't jump into, but There Will Be Blood might be the best movie ever made. The argument here is, well, the, the, the first 15 minutes of that movie is like no speaking, which is incredible, and you're still like entranced. Uh, here, here's the argument <clears throat> for Boogie Nights over There Will Be Blood. Boogie Nights is the most rewatchable movie of all time. Like, I, I, I will hang up and wait. You give me your answer. What's, what's more rewatchable than Boogie Nights? There Will Be Blood, amazing movie. Do you want to watch it a fourth time? I, no, I, I, I watched it twice, and I'm like, I'm good. It, dude, it's so intense. It is so intense. Oh, wow. I, I, am, I am the exact other way. I've probably seen There Will Be Blood like 30 times. Like, really? And I find, I find it is a movie that you can jump into at any point. Like, just eat, like the soundtrack for that movie is a horror soundtrack. And <laughs> you start to watch, and it's like sneakily funny. Not like Boogie Nights funny, but it's, there are just right. moments in a movie that's incredibly serious, incredibly intense that are, you know, just broken up with a bit of levity. And like, they're not jokes per se. But the entire scene of like the oil barracks, oil derricks just like blowing up. And they're like, they, five minute tracking shot of him running up to it, running back through like, I don't know, just his performance so in the movie carries it so much that if he's not as good, the movie can't be good. And as much Correct. as I love Boogie Nights and everyone in Boogie Nights is really good. Like they're just not on Daniel Day Lewis's level. Who is, who is, but the soundtrack to Boogie Nights also oh. fantastic. Yes. Like I, I don't know if I've ever heard a soundtrack that like encompassed and went along with the movie as well as it did. Like it's oh, not something you would put on at home and rock out to, but it's something that really just captured the era of the movie so well. And I think the soundtrack really underrated. Yeah, I don't really want to pick between two of my favorite movies of all time. I, <laughs> I do love them both. So um, any other guilt, any guilty pleasures for you guys? I kind of ran through mine or do you want to get into the, the just misses? I, I'd say so for me, uh, Summer of Sam is a guilty pleasure. Uh, I'm pretty much in on any serial killer movie. And this movie is just like weird as hell. I mean, it is so strange. Like the Adrian Brody, like whole thing. And John Leguizamo is just like a weirdo in general. Um, it, that whole movie, like Mira Sorvino, you could tell she was uncomfortable the entire time during this movie. And then it came out afterwards. She was like, I was freaked out the whole time. It's so strange but I can't help but like it. Like it's a real New York movie and it really captures, you know, it's kind of like Zodiac, but like in a lesser way, I think it kind of captures that mood of like what was going on at this point in time. And I think that's like uh, just an important thing. Like not many movies can do that well. You, you would throw it out as your review of the movie, less good Zodiac. <laughs> <laughs> way less good Zodiac. <laughs> uh, Dean, do you have any guilty pleasures or did they make your top five? Uh, well, I would just like to add on as far that was a Spike Lee movie and like another random Spike Lee movie that kind of like is not first thought of as a Spike Lee movie. Um, Inside Man. Love really Inside Man. Inside Man is fantastic. I don't know when that was made, but like, not 99, but it was really solid. And another movie, again, you never see it. I, you know, it just doesn't pop up. 25th Hour with Edward Norton, Philip Seymour Hoffman. Have you guys seen that? That's excellent. No. I haven't seen it. Yeah, 20, it's 20, a good watch. So, Twenty Fifth Hour, I actually think is Spike Lee's best movie. Crazy enough, I think it's better than yeah. Do the Right Thing. But it's written by David Benioff, based on a David Benioff novel that he wrote. And now, obviously, he just runs Game of Thrones, which is just a weird career progression. Wasn't aware of that. Okay, that's that's good. That I, yeah, that, I thought uh, Spike wrote it for some reason, but yeah, he was, Benioff is actually getting into WWE. Also, I don't know. No, if you... wait, wait a second. <laughs> 25th Hour has like, it has a sneaky good Barry Pepper performance. It's like the first movie, yes. it's the first movie to deal with New York like after 9-11. Rosario Dawson's like the hottest woman on earth, especially then. So that really helps. And I feel bad that Ed Norton doesn't do good movies anymore because he was on such a run and he was so good. And we just don't see him in anything yeah. that's worth watching. That Rounders, American History X. Oh. Um, uh, fight Club run was just like really tremendous. Does Birdman not qualify? Is that not one of those like if they voted on it three years later, Birdman would not be uh, Oscar nominated? What movie? <laughs> no. Yeah, I mean Edward Norton was in Birdman and him and Michael Keaton, right? And oh uh, yeah, I, oh, I watched I watched Birdman like a couple years after it came out, and I was like, I must be an idiot because I don't get it. Like <laughs> this movie, everybody liked this, and I just couldn't. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. The coolest I, thing about it was it, the way, at least the way it was, looks like it was shot. I don't know if that's specifically what it was, but 
it looks like it was an hour and a half movie, whatever it is, that's shot like in like four cuts. Right. Which is yeah, it's just long, long takes. So like really interesting, but I, I didn't get it. I was like, what happened in this movie? <laughs> All right, so I got a few weird movies to throw out here that just kind of lingered with me over the years. They're not necessarily good. They're not necessarily bad. Some people might like them. Man on the Moon is one of them with Jim Carrey as Andy Ooh. Kaufman, the Milos Forman movie. The Red, Viol- yeah. the Red Violin, a Canadian movie with Samuel L. Jackson is shockingly good. It's like three separate stories about like this old violin in a house uh, told over time. Very, very good movie. Uh, Never top- heard of this. Topsy Turvy, the Mike Lee movie is really good about like just now, if you're any sort of creative, you'll just enjoy the movie because it's about the creative process. I feel like anyone who writes, anyone who does anything like that, specifically likes movies geared towards that. So I'd recommend that to anyone. Existence, the Cronenberg movie with Jennifer Jason Lee and Jude Law about like video game futures, just fuck. Well, it's a Cronenberg movie, so of course it's fucked up, but also worth watching. And then I threw Being John Malkovich in there too as a part of that section is they're just all just bizarre movies. Yes, super bizarre. I would throw one of mine as Dogma. Uh, we're hate, we're looking at the winner list. Fucking hate Dogma. I hate Kevin. Do you? The, the only Kevin Smith movie I like is actually Clerks Two. Wow, what? this is crazy because Todd team. is a Canadian in this movie, and I thought you would be really. Oh, let's force it. I mean, we. I feel like we kind of gave up on Atlantis like twenty five years ago. I, I, what do you mean we? Okay, as as, ca- as, What's as, the as Canadians, you just don't hear much from Atlantis anymore. Ugh. I'm 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 still I'm still in Alanis's corner. I'll fight for you, girl. Jack Little Pill was good. <laughs> so by the way, we uh, you mentioned Samuel L. Jackson, and I thought like the chalk was if we're going to mention Samuel L. Jackson, we're going to talk about like Deep Blue Sea. Oh God! How, do, I, I how do you mention on? Samuel L. when you're not talking about Deep Blue Sea and 1999 movies? But and like you know, ridiculous movie, preposterous movie. That's like the definition of like a popcorn guilty pleasure movie. Spoiler alert! And I guess the statute of limitations are up. But the scene where he gets he gets eaten, like gets killed, he's like twenty minutes in. It's like, well, they killed Sammy Allen like twenty minutes in this. Who's gonna survive now? I mean, this was this was like uh, what's his face getting beheaded, Ned Stark getting beheaded in Game of Thrones season one. You know, it's just like <laughs> they killed Samuel now. You know, he's in the middle of like his big like monologue and like we're gonna do this, we're gonna rise up and <laughs> boom, and you're just like, oh snap! Like I I I am I will watch Deep Blue Sea till the very end. Absolutely. Ella Cool J saves the day. You you talk about like Sam Jackson going down in that movie, the Ned Stark stuff. Uh, I guess like every character on the wire is kind of like that too. But there's also another movie. I think it came out in like 2002. It's called 15 Minutes with Robert De Niro, and he legit dies in the first 10 minutes, and you think he's the star of the movie, and it's really terrible. And then it just starts like Ed Burns for an hour and a half, and it's (laughs) it's unwatchable. Doesn't sound good. Yeah. So. Just missed Man of the Moon, by the way. Man of the Moon, the uh, second favorite Jim Carrey movie of all time. I and my favorite is Truman Show. I, that's, it's, I don't know if that's a weird list or not. Of course, that would never, whatever. But Truman Show has so many layers. And Man of the Moon is awesome. Like the way he encap- encapsulates the Andy Kaufman characters is incredible. And uh, I would love to see Andy Kaufman in, in like present day, by the way. But if you could just, how interesting would he be like with Twitter and social media? Whole other conversation. Great, great Twitter account. Yeah, yeah I, um, I, he'd just be a troll on Twitter. I, I think that would be the, the legacy of Andy Kaufman. Um, yeah, so, and, and also there's a, a, a Netflix documentary like a year or two that was just released about like on the set footage of Jim Carrey and like how he would drive like Jerry the King Waller nuts and like threaten to kill him. <laughs> you guys are aware of this? It's amazing. Yeah, I, I, Jim Carrey just encapsulated the character. I, I, I watched the documentary and I was like, if it was me and I was Jim Carrey, because he produced it too, I was like, I would never let anyone ever see this because it makes me look like such an asshole. Or like a really dedicated actor. But yeah, yeah, either way, it can go either way. It's close. Yeah, I, I like Jim Carrey's serious roles. He actually pulled it off. See, I, I'm going to go the other way on this because I feel like Jim Carrey's comedy has now become vastly underrated. And maybe it's worth digging into. Like I say I'm going to do a few of these shows. Maybe the, the movie, the filmography of Jim Carrey is something to get into. But I think we're just all look. I love Ace Ventura. Didn't love The Mask. Dumb and Dumber has to be his best movie. It really does. That, yes. or, that or Liar yes. Liar, which is also excellent. Yeah, well, I guess I stand alone because I, I got uh, Truman Show, which I think is just one of the most clever movies we've ever seen. Uh, I guess I, I guess I'm alone on that. Or just no, using like, Dumb and Dumber is great. Tr- Truman Show is probably the best movie he's been in, but it's not the best yeah. Jim Carrey movie. <laughs> By the way, his serious roles. You're not, uh, Sammy. You're not claiming the majestic. I hope, right? That was. Ooh. I mean, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, but I will claim yes, man. Not a serious role, but I was in on yes, man. But like, I and mean, it's Canada. You speak for Canada, Pat. Is Canada still claiming Jim Carrey? Yeah, oh yeah, we'll, we'll we'll claim Jim Carrey to the death. He's still he's still you know absolutely fan. He's got another career comeback in him. Now I know he's doing like a uh, Trump smear art for a living now, but he's got to come back. And he's in that new Kidding. show. He's doing that Showtime show. Yeah, but he'll he'll end up going back to like a you know, Dumb and Dumber 9 or something like that. And th- eventually it'll start to become funny again. Or maybe a new Ace Ventura. Or maybe even something new. I don't know. But like, I think if you're going to do like the Jim Carrey serious role, it comes down towards Truman Show versus Internal Sunshine. Oh, yeah. yeah. Eternal Sunshine. I will, I will go to bat for Eternal Sunshine. But again, yeah, I, I slept on it. I forgot. That, that's the top three then, I think. <laughs> but 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 then again, like Internal Sunshine is just a really great movie. And like mm. the, the Gondry weird camera tricks in that movie are excellent. Kate Winslet's awesome in that movie. Even Elijah Wood's good. Like it's not really a Jim Carrey movie. It's just him in a good movie. Like a bad, serious Jim Carrey movie is that one where you're like, the numbers were a big thing. Like the number 27. Right. Number 23. <laughs> yeah, whatever the hell that was. <laughs> Oh, so bad. All right, just misses for the list. So I don't really want to step on too much here. So these are these are four that popped up just for me right away. If uh, if they appear on your list, we can just say they appear on your list, and we can move on. I got election. Does that appear on anyone's list? Not for me. It's fine, but not for me. It okay. didn't, didn't crack the list. It's too, too strong. Too, too many options. Okay, I got the insider, talented Mr. Ripley, and American Pie. Also just missed. None of them in my top five, but I but I do love American Pie, and I haven't seen I haven't seen the talented Mr. Ripley in like fifteen years, so I, I don't have great takes on it, but I remember it being good. So the only sort of like research I did for this, instead of going from memory, I watched the talented Mr. Ripley last night, and it's an incredible movie. It's- yeah, it's excellent. The first half, the first hour or so of Jude Law is amazing. Uh, I'm a sucker for Philip Seymour Hoffman. Matt Damon is obviously one. Of, I think he's one of our best actors in the last 15, 20 years or so, as far as landing in the right movies. Uh, I, I'm on board. And is it was it Gwyneth Paltrow? Who's the female? Is that who it is? Yeah, you get you get likable Gwyneth in the movie, which hasn't existed in two decades. Yeah, yeah, she's she doesn't she's perfectly fine. She blends right in, which is like a, that's a compliment, right? I think. Yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. Did did South Park make anyone's list? No, it didn't. And I'm a big South Park guy, but it was one of those things where I like the show better than the movie. So I didn't put the movie in my top five. The movie Even is though the movie. The movie's great. Very, very quotable, like great, like scenes that endure 20 years later. Still not just as good as the show for me. Also one of the only musicals that people seem to like. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah I'll still, I'll still sing it. Uh, what else? The only other one that I'm going to throw America! out. America! Fuck yeah! No, that's, th- that, that's from, uh... That's, uh... Oh, it's <laughs> Team Police! It's the same guys. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's from bad. Team America. Yeah, Dean, well. Dean, you're killing yourself over here. Come on. <laughs> it's not, dude, Dean, you were having a great show, oh, it, was, right? it was Fuck Canada, right? Is that what it was? Something like that? Yeah, Blame Canada. Now, now, I, need, Canada. now I need to look up if Freddie Prince was actually writing for WWF. <laughs> you might be fake news on this one. My credibility is all of a sudden dwindling. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's, it's, there it is. Wow, confirmed. Yeah, two thousand nine. Who who was Matthew thought? Willard also on the writing team or no? Yeah, he, he got to be like a guy who sets up the ring as a part of the contract. <laughs> uh, so the only other one I want to make mention of is a movie that I know that very few people have seen. Uh, it's called The Castle. It's from Australia. And it came out in 1999. I just recommend that everyone go watch it. It is fucking fantastic. It is hilarious. Uh, and I know like four people have seen it. So I don't want to spend too much time on it. But The Castle, a Pat Mayo movie classic. Maybe in the running to be on a Mayo movie classic rewatch if we end up doing that. But that's a movie that I'll throw. Let's get to the top five. Sammy, you're first. All right. Uh, first one was American Beauty. I won't go deep into it because we talked about it already. But... I, I think it's good. I think it was overrated at the time. It's underrated now. American Beauty, I'm in on it. Okay, so Dean, what was your number five? Yeah, the aforementioned Arlington Road, Jeff Bridges, Tim Robbins. This is another one of those movies that just kind of gets lost in the shuffle, lost in history. Probably wouldn't play as well uh, in 2019. Like just people, uh, you know, people like a nice happy ending. And uh, I don't want to, you know, spoiler alert, or I don't want to, you know, give you exactly what goes down. But yeah, uh, and nobody wants to root for the terrorists, but. It's got a really, really, you know, dark ending, uh, but it works perfect as far as, you know, just watching it from a, a movie perspective. Uh, and again, in those movies, like, uh, wh- where is it? Where could you watch this? I have no idea. It's like it never happened. 
But find track down Ellington Road. I don't want to give anything away, but uh, it, it's worth watching. Do you have any memories of this, Sammy? Because like, I, I just remember the ending very vividly, so I don't want to give it away. But like, it's like, oh, you don't see many. You didn't. You don't expect this to come from this movie. You know, it's probably been like 15 years since I've seen Arlington Road, so not really, honestly. Maybe you'll have to go back and rewatch it. Yeah, I got to do that, and then I got to watch The Castle. You, you got you to watch The Castle first. It's very quick. It's probably also very difficult to find. It might even be on YouTube, for all I know, because it's like so... I don't think anyone's suing anyone over people watching The Castle. It could just be up right. wherever it wants to be. But it'd be a good get for like a Netflix or an Amazon Prime or something like that. My number five is Run, Lola, Run. Fun music, if I remember correctly. Uh, did, red hair. Yeah, did this make anyone else's top five? No. Uh. All right, so this was like the first like foreign movie that I ever really got into. And it kind of, I, like there's a lot of movies that came out like this this year. Like um, not so much like this specific format, but like Go told three different stories. Red Violin told three different stories. And Run Lola Run tells the same story three different times with three different outcomes. It's just like high octane the entire time. Even though it's in German, that doesn't really matter. It actually kind of adds to it. Uh, she ends up popping up in Born. The first Born identity is like the female, uh, his love interest, who gets like offed at the beginning of the second one. But this movie is incredible. I recommend it. Like it mixes like cartoon parts with the actual movie. Like you talk about there will be blood being intense. This movie is intense for like all 88 minutes. It is fucking incredible. And again, Dude, that is not going chalk. I should have expected this. Is there a robbery? Is that what's going on? I, I'm getting like a vague recollection. Is it a robbery? In, or? In, in one of, yeah, there's a robbery that goes wrong. There's another robbery. Basically, the premise of the story is, is her boyfriend's indebted to like the German mob, which I assume is a mob you don't want to be fucking around with. But she needs to get a bunch of money very quickly to pay it off. And her dad works as she's like he's like a manager at a bank so she mm -hmm. tries to get the money through him and then like he tries to rob a store she ends up going to a casino it's like three like the day unfolds three separate ways based on different stuff that happens of like who she interacts with like at the very beginning it throws her off her path but she's just like trying to run to go get the money the entire time and it has like house music soundtrack before house music was a thing because this is germany and apparently house music very super cool in 1999 so they were all big on that I don't know, it's a high recommendation for me even if you don't like foreign movies it's not something you need to like watch the subtitles the entire time the action on the screen really does the talking for itself. That's my number five. Reed, Sammy, you're number four. <laughs> All right, number four, we went over it already, so uh, I, I, I won't go too deep into it, but it is the Blair Witch Project. Again, I just think it was so groundbreaking at the time and uh, you know, just so unique. And we live in this world where so many movie uh, tropes are you know, kind of recast and recycled. And the Blair Witch was just something really new and really special at the time. And even though it's aged poorly, I think for what it was in 1999, it's got to make the list. I, I, I had a great experience watching that movie. Yeah, there, there are a few movies that are like that. I think that comedies go a long way. Like horror and comedies are really the, unless it's a movie made specifically, like you talk about like different Paul Thomas Anderson movies. Like when I went to go see Phantom Thread and I went to go see The Master, there's one movie theater in my, like I live in Toronto. And there's one specific movie theater that shows everything. Like if it's shot on 70 millimeter, it's projected on 70 millimeter with the right uh. like projection system so like to go actively see that kind of movie in a theater i think does the movie a lot of justice and but seeing yeah. a horror movie in theaters and seeing like a great comedy in theaters i think there is an experience to that that makes you either fondly remember or negatively remember a great movie and I, I do think that blair witch falls in that like if you didn't see it in theaters you probably think it's really bad oh yeah if you just watch it on cable or something you're just like why was this a thing at all or if you just see it like for the first time like now you're yes. like, this is a terrible movie. This is so stupid. <laughs> I don't get it. This is so underwhelming. I don't get it. Like, why were people scared by this? Yeah. Uh, it's just not. Well, let's stick with you, Dean. What's, what's your number four? Yeah. So I started off with a, uh, an upbeat movie with Arlington Road. And I, I figured I had to go with a comedy, right? So uh, just kind of work, work comedy because the rest of the movies aren't very funny either. And I, I left out American Pie and things of that sort. But uh, you, you speak of comedies not aging well. But this one ages well, and uh, it's still in the vernacular. It's very, very quotable. We're talking about Office Space. Mike Judge's Office Space. We will, uh, you know, well. you know what? We'll, we'll get to Office Space. It appears higher on my list. Oh, all right, mine, mine too. 
Yeah. Okay, so I'm low enough the space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my number, so that's how we'll do it. If it appears higher on someone's list, you just step in and say, hey, we'll get to it then. Uh, at, number, at number four, I got Eyes Wide Shut. Is this Best Christmas movie of all time. That's it. What's that? I knew Dean would be on board with this take. I, I, listen, I, I, I did a best Christmas movie show. It came in at number two in the best Christmas movies of all time. Only what kiss was number one. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Yeah. Which but, is, but, but Gina Davis and Samuel Jackson? No, that's a long kiss goodbye. Same. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, uh, that, it, it's Val Kilmer, Robert Downey Jr. Um, yeah. In a Shane Black. Movie. And, and who's the girl in that? She is so smoking hot. Uh, Michelle Monaghan, I think. Yes, I she's great name. in that movie. Yeah, she's. I she's, felt I fell in love with her in that movie. Uh, so was Corbin Burnson, also excellent in that movie. <laughs> hmm. Shouts to Corbin, but uh, does eyes What's wide up, does <laughs> eyes wide shut appear on anyone else's top here? I I had it in my uh, like uh, you know other nominees, other teams mentioned that kind of thing for sure. I, I would have bet it was in Dean's top five. It's not in my top five, but it's in my honorable mention because again, it's, and also it's, like, I don't understand why people hate it. Like, I remember like my roommate, she came back and she was, she's like, that's the worst movie I've ever seen. It's like a porno. And I'm like, no, it, I, I haven't seen it yet. And I'm like, now I'm even more interested in seeing it, not because of whatever, but to just, I'm sure it's good. Kubrick is a, you know, is a master obviously. And uh, it, it's one of those movies that still sort of holds up. It like, kind of leaves you thinking, leaves you wondering. That piano, the, the, the music, the piano in that, in that movie is just haunting. Uh, you know, the soundtrack. I actually had the soundtrack to that. And uh, don't play it. It will creep you out. Uh, it's a bad <laughs> idea. Do not fire up the soundtrack to a uh, Eyes Wide Shut. And Dean's alone at night with, like, you know, eating at the table with two candles, just listening to Eyes Wide Shut. <laughs> Dude, how freaky is that piano? Hey, it's, it's, just, it's just a single note. It's just a... <laughs> that also, got, think, that, that also was... gets uh, the, the Eyes Wide Shut poster behind me as well. I just... When I when it comes to assessing movies and just what I enjoy personally, there's something about a mood that's created and just like a world that's actually built, and the, like that's the one thing that Cooper gets better than every single other person. And like Tarantino does this well. I don't love Wes Anderson, but he does do this really well. And P.T. Anderson obviously is like the new master of this. That the worlds that they build feel real. And although Eyes Wide Shut is kind of a ridiculous movie, it is. Uh, it just it feels true. And like the beginning of it, like I, I love the very beginning when they go to like the Sydney Pollock like party and people are ODing upstairs and Tom Cruise is a doctor, which is the craziest thing in the world because I think as a Scientologist, he doesn't even believe in doctors, but oh, it, it's <laughs> just believe in science. <laughs> it, it's a great Christmas movie and it's a great relationship movie. <laughs> I think I think the cool thing is that Tom Cruise throughout his whole career has really been kind of this like he had his 80s movies and then he had his action movie phase. And this was one of the few movies that like he tried to get deep and real with and he kind of like dabbled in it and then never really did it a lot other than that. But I think it was one of the first times he really tried to do that. And I think it was a cool step out for him. Well, it, he it, does that in another movie too. That's on my list that we've already kind of talked about. And I guess you probably know what I'm talking about as well. Right, Sammy? Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I guess that was my number four. What's your number three, Sammy? Uh, my number three was Office Space. So uh, you tell me when when the proper time to talk Office Space is. <laughs> All right. I, I, I still got it higher on my list. Uh, Dean. I'm proud of you. Proud of you, Pat. Listen, they're, they're my rankings. They can go how they want. Dean, what do you got at number three? I got Magnolia. Uh, you know, again, with P.T. Anderson, again, not his best movie, but like it's still a great movie and uh, just an awesome watch, like seamless. Like w one scene just kind of inter intertwines and the next just... It's just a day in LA of like eight people. John C. Riley, who could resist him? You, the aforementioned Tom Cruise, and this is not him being an action hero. This is not him, you know, doing his '80s stuff. But uh, he's uh, like an anti-woman. Uh, you know, what, what was? I, Fra what, Fra what was the? the what was it? Respect the cock. Was Respect the cock. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah. So I mean, it, it's higher on your list, Sammy. No, no, it didn't quite make my oh, okay. list. Okay. Um, so, but it, I think it's. But I, but I think it's good. I think it's really good. It's crazy how much overlap in the casting there is with this and Boogie Nights, right? Well, you have those two guys, John C. Riley. You have Julianne Moore. You have Luis Guzman. Philip Seymour um, Hoffman. Yeah, Philip Seymour Hoffman, of course. I'm missing a couple others. I'll, like, I'll look it up. But there's like seven people that cross over. Yeah, you also have like Philip Baker Hall's in it. Morella Walters is in it. Uh, she plays, they're like, Philip. she's Philip Baker Hall's daughter. Uh, 
William H. Macy's in it. Oh, well, yeah, William H. Macy, for sure. The, the, Wizkid. Yeah, Wizkid Donnie Smith. Great names yeah. in this movie. Frank T.J. Mackey, also a great name. No, it, it, it came in at number six or number seven on my list. So I, I, I do really like Magnolia. I do. Alfred, Alfred Molina. Oh, that's true. Alfred Molina. In both movies. In, in, as Wizkid Donnie Smith's boss at the, what is he selling? What's the store? What do they sell there? Oh, I, all I remember is his sales were really bad and yeah. he gets fired. <laughs> But like the oh, oh, it's an electronics store. That's right. Yeah, and I uh, like Ricky Jay does the narration at the beginning. Obviously, he's in Boogie Nights too. I think Seymour Cassell is also in the movie. I might be wrong on that, but like I don't know the the opening five minutes or so really do draw you in. But it is a slow movie. Like it's over. It's it's close to like three and a half hours. Yeah, a hundred and eighty eight minutes. That's a yeah, lot. The eighty man soundtrack keeps it going. It keeps it. That does not hit the rewatchable for me. <laughs> I I like it still. I I could still jump in at any moment and thoroughly enjoy it. But and I I still don't understand the the, the frogs. Like I I think that's a religious tie in thing. That that's just not in my wheelhouse. Yeah. So so throughout the movie, like you talk about, uh, if you go back and watch the Sixth Sense, there's certain things that you see, and I I think eventually we're all going to end up talking about Fight Club at some point, and it, that has the same sort of rewatchability of stuff like oh okay, this makes a lot more sense on the second time that you see it. Uh, it doesn't, I, I don't feel like the religious aspect of the frogs, like it's from Exodus 8-2 and you see like the numbers eight and two pop up like apartment 82. Even when the guy throws himself off the balcony at the very beginning, there's like this oh. weird, weird red wiring that has eight two next to it. So it's all spliced throughout the movie, but I don't actually think P.T. Anderson wants that to be anything. Like I think it's just in it just to fuck with people. <laughs> yeah, mo most of his movies do not have like real religious tones. I mean, the master is the one that has the most religious tones only because yeah. it's basically just a take on Scientology and like how crooked it is. Right. So uh, there's great parts of Magnolia, but there's also just really slow parts. Like when the part when WizKid Donnie Smith gets the braces <laughs> at, and he's in the bar talking to that other guy and they're both hitting on the male bartender and like Goodbye Stranger is playing and like they play the entire song. Like uh, we, we don't need to be here for five minutes. <laughs> No editor necessary for Magnolia. And like yeah, the but I, I like Magnolia. I think it's a good film. So I, I'm not like trying to poo-poo on it. I, I'm not I trying to I'm not trying to poo-poo on it either, but I feel like there's a good 45 minute like the John C. Riley stuff. I love John C. Riley. Like it has nothing. Like you don't need him in the movie. Like his storyline does nothing. Well, he's kind of awkward with the he's kind of flirting with the the girl that has her music all up and uh he's like this awkward police officer, right? Isn't he a police officer? Yeah, he's the police officer, but I, I don't need his background. He could have just been in the movie as the police officer who finds her. I don't need him, like, doing other stuff at the same time. Like, it, it, it's just a bit too fat. Yeah, I, I get But it's, it's like, that's what it is, though. It's about, it speaks about, like, coincidence and just the mundane of a regular, it's just such a standard day. It's all it is. It's like a day in the life of. Uh, it, I, 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 I hear you. But, like, that's, that's sort of PTA's demo, right? He loves a long movie. Like, Boogie Nights wasn't short. Uh, yeah. Never will be below us in short. He doesn't like the editors, apparently. True. Can we talk about how bad of a cop John C. Riley was, though? <laughs> <laughs> he loses his gun. <laughs> well, he was flirting with the girl, and yeah, he was a disaster. <laughs> He, he's also up the drug addict chick yeah it's the zoo <laughs> he's also uh when he leaves his like even the part at the beginning like at the very end of the beginning sequence which is just really really good and introduces all the characters but like it, it ends with him like leaving a i guess this is the days even before like video dating it's like voice dating he's on like phone call answering machine tinder and it shows like yes. him doing bench presses in his house and he's bench pressing like 50 pounds <laughs> It's, it's not but like if we're to rank the best parts of magnolia the best storylines it's the cruise storyline right like wh where was his oscar like this was his moment was yeah. he not nominated for supporting actor he, am he, i making that up he, wa he was but he lost okay to something like preposterous i'm sure uh let's let's see let's see tom cruise lost to oh he lost to muckle kane inside a house rules uh, all right, fair so, enough. The bet, I, I bet, didn't see Cider House Rules, so. Th there was a big, like, people had a real big heart on for Last Hellstrom back in the day, because, like, Chocolat was also nominated for Best Pitcher at a point in time. Like, the uh, not, yeah. not great flicks. So he had Best Supporting Actor that year was Michael Caine, Haley Joe Osment for Sixth Sense, uh, Michael Clark Duncan, Green Mile, Jude Law for Ripley, and Tom Cruise for Magnolia. Like, that has to come down to Jude Law and Tom Cruise of the people that are nominated. Yes. 
Agreed. Jude Law was great. Um, Philip Seymour Hoffman may be more deserving of best supporting actor in this movie. It's a weird Philip Seymour Hoffman performance because he's not a deranged individual. It's like one of the only Philip Seymour Hoffman performances where he's a real good guy. He should he should probably have like four or five best supporting actor awards. Well, Boogie Nights. Well, is is he the best supporting actor in Boogie Nights? Because that's where I would throw John C. Riley into the mix. I know they gave everything to Burt Reynolds, but. Nah. No. I, I I could I could argue Luis Guzman is better in <laughs> in Boogie Nights you than can. Don Cheadle. I mean, you can, but you wouldn't. You yeah, like <laughs> Don Cheadle's entire performance is like a Rick James wig. It, it really is. No, but he's like, like, oh, what are those the cowboy thing? Like, you need a good, you need a new look. He's like, I got a look. What's your look? Chocolate love. <laughs> When he's looking at the uh, the donuts though, before like, and then he's wearing the all white suit and the blood, I, I love that scene. Everything about oh, that scene's amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, that oh. that that like twenty five minutes in Boogie Nights because it goes into them filming like I guess we should just do a Boogie Night show at some point between the three of us. We should, <laughs> but like it goes from Wahlberg getting the the guy who picks him up to watch him beat off in the truck and then beats the crap out of him. And then they have Jack Horner and Roller Girl filming like the reality porn in the back of the limo into that right. scene. When and, things are going bad. And and then I believe I might have the chrono I, I might have this out of order, but I think it then goes into the Alfred Molina scene. Yes, which is to me the best scene in the movie. That scene, you know, with uh it, you know, the music playing, uh, Cos what is it? Uh, Cosmos in the background throwing the firecrackers. Oh, I mean, oh. <laughs> Cosmo throwing the firecrackers is just like the most like, dude, you're jumping when it's happening because you know some shit's going to go down and he's throwing firecrackers. You're like, what's going on? You got the bodyguard with the straight like handguns just like in his shit. You have, I mean, the the music. Uh, God, what I'm I'm missing on the song. It's it, 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 it goes it, motoring. Yeah, it, it, it goes it goes from yeah, Je it, it goes from Jesse's girl to sister Christian into ninety nine Luft balloons are the three songs. Right. And that's right. Actually, right when right when homeboy gets blasted in the gut by Molina. <laughs> yeah. So in that scene, like there people have like a just so many different favorite parts in that scene alone. Like the Wahlberg, like dead stare is a great part. Uh, Cosmo in the background, throwing the firecrackers is fantastic, <laughs> but there, there's something like, it's very clear that uh, Paul Thomas Anderson had done a bunch of cocaine in his life uh, before he wrote this. Cause the Correct. entire discussion that Alfred Molina has, and he starts freaking out about how people put songs on tapes in a certain order. And he was talking about how he has a mixtape and it's called like yes. his awesome mix. Number seven It's like, I want to listen to the songs in the order that I want to listen to them. No one's going to tell me what to do. It's just a very underrated coked out guy, like speech, someone would give <laughs> so good so what a weird good. take that but yeah it's amazing. yeah and philip seymour hoffman i i would probably put him as the best supporting actor it's really close but i mean it's 20 years later sometimes when i screw up i still just go i'm a fucking idiot i'm a fucking idiot fucking idiot like over and over you know that's Wait, iconic it's just i'm just gonna sleep on a long came poly where he's talking about charting is that not on the is that not, <laughs> is that not happening here so what? So what would you rank as the best? Let's get back to Magnolia instead of just turning this into a boogie di nights discussion. <laughs> like, what, what? What are the three stories? If you had to live with three stories from this movie, and that's what it was going to be, who are the three characters that you would want to follow? I feel like it's Cruz. He ties into Phil if he ties into Philip Seymour Hoffman later, but even the Philip Seymour Hoffman Julianne Moore stuff is really good. I'm trying to think about what the other one would be. Wizkid? I maybe a hundred percent Wizkid. Wizkid's real depressing. Yes. But it works. Yeah, we we all like child stars. <laughs> well, they grew up. That that's right. that's the other part too. Like I mean, like the, and Magnolia gets weird when like obviously the frogs come, but there's also the part where everyone's singing that Amy Mann song. <laughs> <laughs> I I still don't understand why that happens. I think it's because he was dating Amy Mann at the time, trying to get her that those soundtrack bucks. <laughs> well, she did the entire soundtrack, right? I believe so. She did some of the songs, but like obviously like. Uh, like, goodbye. Oh. like there's one like the beginning of the one is the loneliest number is in yeah. it. it it's also a really good soundtrack i just it gets rated against boogie nights because it was the follow-up and it's just not as good well yeah again but it's not fair but yeah boogie nights is better but it's still an amazing movie but yeah sure i i concede 
but like it, it's almost like eyes wide shut in that sense too that if you start comparing it to other kubrick movies like it doesn't say it's better than full metal jacket but that's probably about it Maybe how dare you full metal jacket is it's half of a, the best movie of all time <laughs> The first, half, <laughs> really the, first is, half, the first half is so good and the second half is not good. Yeah, so that, that that's really tough to go with when all is said and done. Like, Barry Lyndon is super slow, but if you like cool lenses on cameras and like costumes, I, I guess that's good. That's super boring. That's probably like his worst of like the conventional movies. But when you start getting into, I mean, what do you think is the best Kubrick movie? Sammy, I, I'm, I'm yielding. I, I have I have a very easy answer to this. I, it's Doctor Strange Love, and it's not close. I've never seen it. What? It's, it's what? What did you say? It, it, the, I've it, never seen Doctor Strange Love. Should I have seen it? I haven't seen it either. Uh, it, it is a top three movie of all time. It is the best, and it still holds up to this day, all despite being in black and white. Yeah, I mean, I God, I really like two thousand one A Space Odyssey. I really like The Shining. Like. I'm I'm glad no one went to like the the Clockwork Orange as the best because it's not the that's best. That's where my brain went. I was thinking that, and I was thinking uh, uh, as Eyes Wide Shut is another conversation as well, and uh, the one you just mentioned that with the Here Comes Johnny or Here's Johnny at the the, the, the Shining. Hotel. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess you guys you, know, you got to watch the Castle, Run Lola Run. I mean, start with Doctor Strange Love as it is legitimately one of the best movies of all time. All right, I'll put it on the list. All right. Yeah. Number three on my list. Actually, Dean, did we get to yours? That was Magnolia, right? Magnolia, yeah. yeah. And Sammy, what was your number three? It was Office Space? Office Space, yeah. All right, I'm going number three, Three Kings. Uh, did this get any higher on your guys's? No, it was it was honorable mention for me, but very enjoyable movie. It is a fascinating movie. Like, it's fascinating as a war movie. It's fascinating as a heist movie. And it weirdly just really holds up well over 20 years. And the performances are all really solid. And even, I, I think getting like comic actors, like even throwing like Spike Jones into the mix, uh, Mark Wahlberg basically coming off of Boogie Nights isn't really a great actor. It's a great Clooney performance, but like Nora good, Dunn is good in it. Good year for him. Good year for Marky Mark. What, what else came out with Marky Mark this year? Well, you're probably oh, thinking that, Boogie well, Nights, but that's a different year. Oh, know? yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm conflating him. So anyway, I, what, year was, what year was Boogie Nights? It was like 97? 90, that sounds right. I think it was 96. It came out the same year as like Goodwill Hunting came out, Titanic came out, LA Confidential, which gets forgotten from that year is also fantastic. But those- Yeah, those 90, movies, 97 Boogie Nights. Those movies all came out in the same year, so. Okay. But yeah. What, what year was Fear? Fear's a closet, a closet terrible movie that I'll watch. 96. Reese Witherspoon, uh, yeah. Any anything young Reese, Reese Witherspoon, which is why we like Cruel Intentions, also. But you don't love Election. I mean, it's 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 good. It's good. Good movie. Hey, hey, I, I'm just I'm throwing Three Kings out here. I, I it's hard to even describe why I enjoy it so much, but it's just it's a completely different type of war movie. I feel like we've seen these now over the past twenty years, but this was sort of the first of its kind and. I, don't, I think it's David O. Russell's best movie. People will say like Silver Linings. People will say maybe American Hustle. I think this is like it for him. Yeah, and it's and, and it's kind of like that like post Gulf War, yeah, kind of kind of time frame where I think at the time it was it was like an interesting take on that whole thing. You know, it's hard to make a war movie fun, but this was a fun war movie. Dude, when he throws the football with like the C4, <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. There's also the great shot of when the bullet goes into Wahlberg and you get like the inside the gut artery shots of the bullet and like every time that his lung is collapsing. That's a, just a super cool shot. Bro, I'm, I'm super squeamish when it comes to that stuff. And I'm just like, <laughs> that was that was a rough watch. But you also get like between Ice Cube, Wahlberg and Clooney, you're getting them all at like right of the beginning before they become like massive, massive. I know Wahlberg was in Boogie Nights, but he still wasn't like a gigantic star at this point. And like yeah, Clooney, Boogie Nights was his first like I'm taking off role, I think. And like even Clooney, like Clooney's not in huge movies before this. Like he's not like a legit, legit movie star. And then Ice Cube just becomes a movie. Like he had Friday, he had this, and then he was just in movies. Yeah, and Friday, his best movie for sure. I'm trying to think, is it his? I, I would say Three Kings is probably his best movie. I do enjoy Friday though. Yeah. All right. Friday, Friday might be the movie I've watched the most overall times in my life. All right, Dean, what's number two on your list? <laughs> I, I was thinking of the movie I, I probably watched the most in my lifetime, and it's the most bizarre answer because I watched it a lot as a child. 
Uh, Disorderlies, don't recommend it, but that's the movie I've probably seen more than anything else because we had a VCR in one movie. What was that one movie? Disorderlies. Number two on my list uh, is American Beauty, the aforementioned American Beauty. I don't know what's left to be said. Huh. All right. Uh, I guess, have we talked about American? Is there anything more to add about American Beauty at this point? I mean, not much. I just think it's, it's a really well-made movie. I, I just, uh, and I can rewatch it. It's like, it's not heavy enough to where I don't mind rewatching it. I was just on Amazon Prime the other day and it popped up as like an available movie. And I'm like, shit, let's watch this. And I just enjoyed it all the way through. It's really enjoyable for me. I think that, I mean, you say it's not a very heavy movie. I think that's the problem with it, though, is that it tries to be a really heavy movie at the end. And the best parts right. of the movie are sort of the more fun parts of the movie. Yeah, I, I like the fun parts of it, man. I'm into it. But like I said, that whole, you know, going through a midlife crisis, like I don't know if there's a better midlife crisis movie. When he's working the window at the fast food, that's a fun scene. <laughs> and his wife and the king show up. <laughs> and Annette Benning, I think she got nominated for uh, Best Supporting Actress. She was really good in this. Yes. When she when she doesn't make the sale on the house and she's like hitting herself like with the blind behind her and everything, that's a good scene, man. She falls into the closet, I believe. It's like, yeah, just start trying. It's a, it's, it's, it's a powerful scene for sure. Yeah. She's solid. She, she yeah. was up for lead actor. She lost to Hillary Swank in Boys Don't Cry. Oh, that was on my list, by the way. And not one person, nobody was watching the next Karate Kid and said, this gal here, she's going to win two Oscars. Not one, but two. Hillary Swank, good for her. Boys Don't Cry was great. And uh, what was her other second Oscar? The boxing movie, right? I think so, I imagine so. Yeah, that was on my honorable mention. Some other, baby. I, uh, head nod. Yeah, what million, was it? Million Dollar Baby. There you go. Yeah, yeah Hillary not, Swank. not great. <laughs> you guys didn't like Boys Don't Cry? I, I liked it. I it, didn't, I didn't a, like Million Dollar yeah, I, I wasn't big on Million Dollar Baby. I was going to say, Boys Don't Cry is just a tough watch. Yeah. Sure. You don't want to see it more than two times. Maybe or, once. M- maybe once. Once was probably enough, and I saw it when I was 14, so it was like, ooh, I, I don't really quite get what's going on here. <laughs> who, is the, uh, yeah. who is the girl, the other girl in the movie? Chloe, what's her face? Chloe Sinek. Who was in so, Big Love? Yeah. The, the scene between them is just, I don't know what's going on there when I'm 14. I do now, but like I'm just like, ooh. <laughs> I think it was based on a true story, too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, uh, Sammy, what's your number two? Uh, my number two is Fight Club. All right. And so I, I guess we're saving. I guess we'll save Fight Club. Yeah, we'll save it for, for the number one spots. Yeah. So I, I guess that this is down to three movies because number two, I have Fight Club at one. I got Office Space at number two. Dean, I'm guessing between I guess you have Fight Club at one and Sammy, I'm guessing you have The Matrix at number one. Oh, yeah. All right, so let's start with Office Space. Let's start with the, I guess all three of these movies are fun in sort of a different way, but is Office, because I remember seeing Office Space at the time. Like I saw it in theaters, and obviously I wasn't a workaday individual anymore. So it was one of the first movies I can ever remember that like no one saw in theaters, and then it became like a revelation on VHS after the fact. Like it was always, always rented at Blockbuster uh, whenever you would go for like the next five years. Yeah, it be- became a classic. And it, I mean, Dean mentioned this earlier, but 20 years later, the fact how how just quotable and rewatchable it is, the fact that it's jiffable on Twitter. And I mean, people are still talking about TPS reports and still <laughs> talking about doing two chicks at the same time, man. It's just like, dude, it is so quotable and so hilarious. I mean, it's just, and, and it's funny, you're talking about these three movies, The Matrix, uh, Fight Club and Office Space. They're all about being trapped in kind of different ways. And I think that's really interesting because, uh, because you know, the, the movie that I mentioned before, American Beauty, also about being trapped in a lot of ways. A lot of really similar thematic schemes uh, through all of this. Is this just what the late 90s were all about? This is what people were going through in their lives? I mean, it must have been. It must have been. Because, I mean, in a way, being John Malkovich is kind of about that in the same way. <laughs> right. Well, I think one of the themes, uh, just talking about Fight Club, that comes up in Fight Club is, is that different generations had these whole uniting things. Like our grandparents had World War II, and our parents had the like Vietnam and hippie revolution. These like things that united them, and we really did it in a lot of ways. And we really like morphed into this like, like late capitalism consumer culture. And Fight Club is really about. Uh, getting back at that and and saying no I won't be a part of that and I think maybe that has to do with a lot of this idea of like being trapped in like our societal norms 
So if we had to rank the characters, maybe maybe not Peter Livingston from uh, from Office, not Peter Livingston, Peter Gibbons, Ron Livingston from Office Space. If we had to rank the periphery characters in Office Space, Dean, what, who are we looking at here? Who's the next best? Is it Michael Bolton? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's it's Michael Bolton, or I'm trying to think of also. And it's not it's not Jennifer Aniston, right? Like she's fine. She she works in wellness, movie, but that's that's not the answer. Well, why is it not Lumberg? Is it is Lumberg not in the conversation? Uh, yeah. I think Lumberg's in the conversation. And who's uh, what's what's the neighbor's name? Oh, D- Diedrich Bader. That's his real name. <laughs> right, right. He's definitely in the conversation, also. <laughs> Uh, I'm totally spacing on his last name. The guy from Scrubs, Dr. Cox from Scrubs, John initial. C. McGintley. John C. McGintley. He throws like 3000 miles per hour in every scene he's in. It's like, yeah, two scenes. I mean, the bobs are just the bobs are what it's all about. <laughs> what exactly do you do here? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, the, the one thing, the, the one part of the movie I don't like is the Milton character, which is what it's based on, which is just really strange. It's the one part that doesn't like fit with the rest of the movie. It seems. It was yeah, the Milton's fine, thing. but they minute they they. I think they did okay, like minimizing him. You know, I mean, they had to have him to like to like start the fire and everything, but you know, he's 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 strange. He's funny, but I, I think that there's less Milton in the movie. Um, than there could be, and I'm okay with that. I guess we got we got to throw a special shout out to Samir and Naga, 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 Naga work here anymore. <laughs> and he's like, I don't, I don't see what's so hard about it. It's just how it sounds. Naya, Naya, John, Naya, Naya, John. And I, I don't, I don't know who the actor is, but he just like pops up in a ton of stuff. That really, really sad guy who ends up like trying to kill himself, but has the jump to conclusions. Matt, I don't know what his name is, but he is fucking fantastic in this movie. <laughs> When, when Samir just goes, this idea, this is horrible. It's just like the best. <laughs> I, it's a hard movie to talk about because all you end up doing is just quoting it the entire time. Yeah, I know, I know. You got the guy with the old with the O face. You know, he comes in throwing pretty hot too. Oh, Dr- Drew with the O face. Yeah, Drew. Yeah, Lumberg yeah. factor. <laughs> Lumberg. You, th- you thought I was talking about Bill? Ah, their children right. have horns. Yeah, no. It, <laughs> It's a fantastic. It's funny. It got underrated at the time. It feels like Idiocracy got underrated when that came out too. Now that's more of like a spoof, but it's shockingly realistic. And frankly, I mean, Beavis and Butthead was a big thing when it came out for Mike Judge, but like King of the Hill is vastly underrated at this point too. I, it's it safe to say he's just underrated in general. Maybe, yes. but like yeah. pe- people seem to love Silicon Valley. He's finally getting the credibility he's deserved all along. How about that? Is that fair to say? Yeah. I think, I think yeah. that's pretty fair. All right, so... Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a Mike Judge fan. All right, sure. Sammy, why is The Matrix number one on your list? Oh, boy. Uh, God, do we have 15 minutes? I mean, so for me, the, the Matrix, not just one of the best films of the year, but best films of probably the decade. Like, on a personal level, so this was my first year off at college, right? And I came home for, like, one of our breaks. I'd never heard of The Matrix in my life. I didn't know who was in it. I didn't know what it was about. I wasn't watching TV in college. I come home and my friends are like, dude, let's like go smoke and like go see the matrix. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) And after the first six minutes of that first Trinity scene, I was like, Oh shit, it is happening. Like this movie is for real. And I think it was so cool in the way that it was really important at the time, because again, the internet was just kind of becoming a thing. And this was very much like the undertones it's, it's being trapped by technology, right? It's being owned by technology. It's being owned by the internet. And I think 20 years later, those issues are still very important and very real to us. And then obviously just, dude, the fight scenes are so legit. Like at the time, like the technology going on there was really revolutionary. I can still watch it 20 years later and I'm still like, dude, this looks good. And I mean, it's just, it's such a good philosophical movie and such a good action movie both at the same time. And you don't see that a lot. I, I guess the the one thing that really detracts from it, at least over the years, has been how many movies ripped off the fight scenes and camera angles yeah. and everything else that it, if you didn't see The Matrix first, it would seem less good, I think. But like any time that The Matrix is just on, you can start it up at any point. And I think it has more to do with like, I don't know, I think it's a better action movie than it actually has anything to say about anything because it just feels like, 
the philosophy of the movie, well, the underlying message, like you said, being trapped by technology, I think is something that's pretty universal and was held up really well. The actual like mythology of the movie just sounds like two stone guys talking to each other. Correct. And I must point out that the Matrix 2 and 3 are god awful. And they really took this, this kind of series, a movie that I thought as a standalone was fantastic. Um, they really took it in a weird direction that I don't think was good. But the music is good. I mean, you know, the, the outro song there uh, is just so fantastic. I think, you know, there needs to be more rage against the machine in movies and there's not. Uh, Dean, what did you make of The Matrix when you saw it? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a lot to add here. Again, I, I saw it once like 20 years ago, whatever it was, give or take, and I thought it was fine. But again, not my wheelhouse, not my genre. I don't <laughs> think I ever revisited it. It's okay. No. No. Uh, <laughs> oh no, you guys. This is I, I don't hate the Matrix. Like, like, I, I thought it was so okay. Good. It was interesting. It's a little bit different than everything else you kind of see. And obviously it's a, a spin on the action genre. But, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was the most interesting thing to me. I mean, I this completely derails the conversation. But just the plausibility of just kind of working out the math that both, both Wachowski brothers transitioned to women at two separate times in their life. Like, what are the odds? I don't know, but they, uh, good for them. Live your life. Have a good time. But Is that true? I didn't know this. Both Wachowski brothers have since transitioned at two different times in their life. You know, like independent of each other, I think. Huh. Yeah. Was it, it wasn't a joint transition? It was... No, no, no. Like, it wasn't like a two-for-one deal. At what I'm saying. <laughs> they're, it's that, they're now Lana and Lily Wachowski. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that's... There you go. Fun fact, I guess. What is their, like, I'm just looking at their, trying to find their filmography right now. So what do they do after this? I'm trying to figure out what the other one, did you ever, okay, did you see Cloud Atlas or Jupiter Ascending? Any of those two movies? I saw a half a Cloud Atlas and I was like, dude, this is four hours. I can't do it. <laughs> you you thought I, I, it Atlas. <laughs> I didn't see Jupiter Ascending, but it looked really interesting. I have no idea really what it's about, but I was like, this looks just fascinating. And I just never went back to it ever again. Did, did either of you see Cloud Atlas? No. No. Okay, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't, don't see it. It's. <laughs> Should I see The Matrix again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, maybe, maybe not. So for me, I think the, the real power of The Matrix, especially was when it came out, right? Again, it's that thing with Blair Witch where it was just like so groundbreaking, so new. Uh, the, you know, I mean, we'd had themes of being trapped by technology for a while. You know, we saw these in the Terminators, et cetera. Um, but the fact that this was really internet based um, and the possibilities that were there from the internet at the time, I think were pretty groundbreaking and pretty prescient as we look forward. I'm not sure if you like saw it for the first time now, how you'd like feel about those things because yeah. they hold up. But it, like, like uh, Pat said, now it's been done over and over and over. But I think at the time, the Matrix was just like so ill. And I'll still watch it anytime, any point in that movie. Like some of the camera shots that they get in this movie are super cool. And I know we're like CGI'd out at this point. So like the the cinematography and the ability to do those things has kind of uh, definitely gotten better in the last 20 years. But dude, at the time, I still think it's good now, but at the time it was completely out of control to see some of the things they were doing with the filming here. What do you think is the best scene in the Matrix? Like if you were just going to jump in for 10 minutes and there was a scene that you wanted to see, it has to be the Morpheus rescue in the building at the end, right? For, so for me, it's the Kung Fu scene. That's the one I like the best. I like the Kung Fu scene when when uh, when Neo, uh, whoa, I know Kung Fu. <laughs> Show me. You know, I, I love that scene, but I, I think it's a close second with that, with the, with the rescue scene, because they have that shot where he gets, uh, Morpheus gets overtaken by the policemen, where they all come at him from the top. Um, and they're, and they're in the building before that, and they're falling down the side. They have that side view when they're in the walls of the building. And then when they break Morpheus out and they got all the guns, like, that's just like so tight. Yeah, it, it lives on as an awesome action movie. And I think that's the one part that people don't really think, like when they think of The Matrix, it's like, oh, a breakthrough in fight scenes or a breakthrough in special effects or this weird like stoner mythology that goes along with it. And people can really dig in and see what they want from it. But it's just at its core, it's an awesome action movie. And frankly, yes. all, the, all the stuff that takes place outside of The Matrix, not great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could do with less uh, Ebenezer, uh scenes for sure. All right. Uh, I guess it's time to jump into Fight Club. Um, yes. It's weird because 
people feel very differently about this movie in many different ways. It means a lot to a lot of different people. Like, I guess, I guess Sammy and Dean, you guys were in college when this came out. So it would be, did everyone have Fight Club posters up? Yes. I think everybody had Fight Club posters. Everybody wanted to be Brad Pitt. And I think that's a, that's a big part of this is nobody wanted to be Edward Norton and everybody wanted to be <laughs> Brad Pitt. And yet I think a lot of us have both sides of those in us. And I think that was at the heart of what Fight Club is. So Edward Norton wanted to be Brad Pitt. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Brad Pitt was everything he wanted to be. Tyler Durden, man. Yeah. I, I like a movie that rewards you for paying attention and just kind of like the flicker of Tyler Durden at the, the beginning of the movie. Uh, they, they sort of, they threw like a penis up there for no particular reason. Just kind of like a, just a one frame. If you're paying attention, you catch it. You know, of course they show it, you know, it's really clever. They kind of tie it into the, the movie, but uh, yeah. I, does, do we all have Fight Club at one or I guess, did you not have Fight Club at all, Sammy? Or is that two? I've had, I've had it too. And Pat, you had it at one as well. Right? I, I had it at one as well. Like, what do you make of like the the main criticisms of this movie? Is that it? It's not necessarily a criticism of the movie itself. It's that the people that this movie was really embraced by was like the peak of bro culture. Like, Tower Durden's the coolest guy on the planet. Like, we want to go fight each other. Like, all, it seems like all the wrong parts of the movie that a certain sect of people really took out of it hurt the movie for a long time. But it feels like people have come back around to it now. Like. For me, I mean, you talk, Dean, you talk about like the rewatchability of it and like picking up on things. Like there's even a scene, uh, probably like the 20th time I watch it, Edward Norton's walking off a bus and he has the Project Mayhem folders in his arms that you see <laughs> later on in the movie. You're like, oh shit. Like they're telling you what's going on here. Uh, people have really vibed with like, I wouldn't say it's anti-capitalist. It's more anti-consumerism than anything else. But like in 2019, people are big on that. Not so much me. I love buying things and it does make me happy. But other people, they're not so into that. But there's just a coolness to this movie that's really hard to replicate. Like it's the best Brad Pitt. Like it basically takes everything that was good about Brad Pitt in... Um, when he's the stoner on the couch, uh, true romance, uh, and like the cra oh, yeah. and the craziness from Twelve Monkeys, and then injects the part of cool of Brad Pitt that we see in like Ocean's Eleven later, and just puts it yeah, into and the, this and, the, movie. and the big hooks from Snatch. Yeah, like it, it's it. What what is the best scene in this movie? I'll start with you, Dean. Oh man, uh, the best scene in the movie. Oh, Jesus, um, I'm so many are running through my head. I'm not exactly sure. What, what you know when he's. Uh, when he's fighting himself, which is pretty awesome. Edward Norton's fighting himself. I, I love that scene. But running down the rules, the rules of Fight Club is a great scene. Um, Jesus. Uh, do, 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 do. I, I, I can't really narrow it down to one. I, gotta, I, you know, I, gotta, I haven't seen this movie, to be fair, like in like a good 10 years. All right. So uh, it was a little bit rusty to me, but those uh, are the first ones that kind of pop in my head. I, I, like, I like any and all Project Mayhem scenes. I'm like fully in on those when they like – you know, when they're breaking into the fat factory and all that stuff, like, you know, they're just causing mayhem throughout the, throughout the city when they kidnap the guy and throw him down and they're like, do not fuck with us. We <laughs> are the people that, you know, serve your food and clean your toilets. Like, dude, that, that stuff is all great for me. Yeah. I mean, do people underrate how funny this movie is? Cause I, it's, Hilarious. it's a dark comedy. If people don't view it as a dark comedy, I really think they've watched the movie wrong. Yeah. And, 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 you know, to me, it's really, you're talking about that anti-consumerism thing, you know, that we, that we didn't have this big uniting force in our generation. And I think that's a central theme in this, right? And then it's like, okay, how do we define masculinity, right? It's about defining masculinity. And it's like, no, it's not about who can have the nicest clothes and the best furniture and all that. That shit's all bullshit. And that's what Tyler Durden is. He's just like, the person who doesn't subscribe to any of that and is not afraid to live his life exactly how he wants to do it. And I think we all have a part of us inside us that want to be just like that. So it's not just Edward Norton that says, this is how I want to be. It's all of us. And I think, you know, whether you're a man or a woman, I think there's a big part of that that you relate to Tyler Durden. And yeah. I think that's what's really enduring, especially as like our late stage capitalism like gets deeper and deeper. I think those themes are you know really central and really important 
Well, it's strange. Like you hit on that. It's the lifestyle. What he's talking about is that what people relate to. But I'm one of the people that took it the wrong way. Like I thought the Tower Durden looked cool. He dressed cool. People, people do this. Like if I could take my shirt off and look like Brad Pitt in that movie, I would sign up for that. I'm not going to lie to you. Like that, that was the cool part of the movie to me when I was like 14, 15. Yeah. And great, even, great hair also. Great Brad yeah, Pitt like he, hair. He was just like the coolest guy in the world. Well, the and, jacket, like, don't sleep on the jacket. The jacket was awesome. <laughs> like tied it all together. Okay. So the lizard, the red lizard skin the... oh yeah it was it was pretty nice so so who has the cooler jacket is it brad pitt in this movie or is it jamie lannister in game of thrones <laughs> <laughs> I'd, I'd wear i'd wear brad pitt stuff out any day of the week <laughs> yeah i'm gonna yield the i'm gonna yield the pit as well but it's funny this is part of like part one of the brad fit brad pitt fashion icon movement because in this movie people tried to emulate how he dressed and he was just like the coolest dressed guy in the world in ocean's eleven but yeah. in, in a very and like, always, and, he, and he was always eating in Ocean's Eleven, which eat, is just a great. <laughs> yeah, he, he's a good eater. Yeah, he was eating fast food every single time too. So it's pr- probably hard to maintain the Brad Pitt physique when you're just pounding nachos into yourself the entire yeah. time, or like chili fries. The best scene yeah. in the movie, the one that just pops out in my mind over and over, and there's a ton of them. It's the part when the owner of the place where they have the Fight Club, Lou, comes downstairs. Oh, yes, Lou. And just Lou. Lou's beating the shit out of him. And when he gets back up, he just starts bleeding all over Lou and just screaming and laughing. You don't know where I've been, Lou. That is the freakiest fucking thing in the world. <laughs> so good. Like, it's so, like, terrifying, yet also hilarious at the same time. It's just, it, it, it's, and it's so immaculately made too. Like in lesser hands from like Fincher and the writing of this movie and the acting in this movie, it could be truly disastrous, but everything just hits uh, exactly the right note, which makes it so good. I will watch anything that David Fincher does. I, I don't know if you're in on this Dean, but I think Fincher is just like such a master and he's so good. Well, the aforementioned Zodiac, right? Hmm? So you're, you're Zodiac. I, I love seven. 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 seven might be in my top five movies all time. I know that the end has been lampooned. But that is such a well-made movie, front to back. Have you guys read Fight Club or any of Palatnik's other novels? No. Nah, I tried to read what was it called, Choke, and just like it, I, don't know, I didn't like it. Dude, they are they are heavy and thick to read through. But I I read Fight Club after I saw the movie, and if you want to read a really good book, Fight Fight Club the book is almost better than Fight Club the movie. And that's saying something. How, how did like how does the reveal work in the book? Like how do you not know? Yeah, you know, honestly, it's been it's been 15 years since I read it, so I don't remember specifically. Because you you cannot read Palatnik books multiple times. You can barely read them once. He is the wackiest motherfucker you have ever read in your life. Or just like what is happening here? Um, but I I don't know how they made Fight Club into a movie. The fact that they did it, if you read the book and you're like, how did they make this into like a huge movie? You would be bewildered. I still am. Well, it, people say that about a lot of things, though, and it always seems to work out. Like Game of Thrones, you can never make this into a TV show. It'd be, unpo- it'd be impossible. And it turns out they could do it. They said that about Watchmen. I actually liked Watchmen, and now they're making like a TV show about Watchmen. It's like, oh, it's unfilmable. Like, that's not true. You can film things now. Like, we have technology. Yeah, yeah I mean, if you have David Fincher, it definitely helps. This is true. By the way, uh, the theme of like, you know, talking about, you know, ending credits and music and all that, you know, the Pixies, Where Is My Mind? That that, that final scene is awesome. Yes. I heard that they worked on it for like a year. Well, it was time well spent. Yeah, it was really, really good. Bumping the Pixies out there right at the end was just like, completely agree. So, yeah, I'm trying to think now. Like, the... The craft of this movie, I guess, and this is kind of goes across the board for all Fincher movies, but it's sort of like a perfect confluence. And Seven was like this, too, is like the mood of this movie is absolutely right. And like I talked about with Eyes Wide Shut, that's what I like about movies, that the yeah. world feels real, the mood feels real, and it has a certain vibe to it that's just different. This and Seven both accomplish that, but I feel like the actual producing of this movie from like, you talked about like the soundtrack, the sound mixing, the visual effects, it's all right there. And the filters that they use in this movie to shoot it are just immaculate. Like it has a very distinctive look to it. Yeah, yeah, the filters and it's the same thing with Seven, right? Seven is just like so dreary the entire time. Everything is so gray. And this movie really like goes back and forth between that. By the way, a closet great scene is when Edward Norton uh, quits his job. That's probably yes. like a top three 
top three scene in that movie for me. That or the very sneaky part of Helena and Bottom Carter was walking into a laundromat and taking all the clothes and then selling it. <laughs> are you are you stealing those clothes? Yeah, so <laughs> she is she is underrated the thing that holds this movie together too. She's great. She's really great. And I, is she smoking in every scene she's in? Uh yeah. Maybe that's why you like her so much. That may, maybe that could be a thing too. Uh, all right, let's reassess finally before we get out of here. If we were to name, like, let's say if we do five, we'll do five, maybe three. If we're talking about like best picture, we're re legislating best picture 20 years later. What are the five nominees? I think the insider, Fight Club. F- Fight Club, I think the insider and the Matrix both make it because the insider is just, a, it's not my favorite movie, but it's an awesome movie. Like, it's a good movie. Yes. Yeah, I think that makes it, uh, I think American Beauty would probably still get nominated. Um, It's very close, but I think Magnolia should be in there, even though I wasn't like Magnolia top five. I think as a, just as like a straight film, I I think it's really, really good. And it would be nominated. It would be in there. Yeah, I don't know if American Beauty would make the cut anymore. Like the the ones I think I would come down to. So we'd have Matrix, we'd have Matrix, we'd have Fight Club, we'd have The Insider. What'd you just say again? Magnolia? Would, yeah. be, would be in there. And then I think it comes down to like Three Kings, Eyes Wide Shut, Talented Mr. Ripley, Election potentially, like those types of movies. Ripley would probably still be there, I think. Yeah, Ripley's really good. Yeah. And this yeah, is- Yeah, it still holds up plenty. Like it's, you know, the way it's shot, obviously you can watch it in any year. It's it's awesome. Yeah. And, and you get uh, the Anthony Min. What's his, I can't pronounce his last name. His son's an actor now, too. But he's coming off, like, big English patient vibe, so anything that he did was going to get nominated. Yeah, and obviously the Matrix would win now, so yeah, yeah, that it, goes without saying. It'd be Matrix or Fight Club, I would think. It, it would be such a, an achievement to award David Fincher an Oscar now. It really would. Has he won one? No. Travesty. It's Complete funny. travesty. And it's funny that his best chance at winning an Oscar was for Benjamin Button. What? That's yeah, I, 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 I think, think and that's like his. Well, I don't think I don't think Zodiac was really well received at the time. Fight Club wasn't well received at the time. Neither was Seven. You know? Yeah, I mean these these films need a while, I think, for society to figure out that they're really true. Did you not win anything for Social Network? That was oh, not nominated. I think it was. I, I, to- oh, I, yeah, I, I totally I totally forgot about the Social Network. Yeah, yes, that was his best chance. Won. But yeah, but he didn't win. But like right. when when Benjamin Button came out. It was it was like released like this is Forrest Gump ten years later. This is going to sweep the Oscars. And it was just a bad movie. Random aside, do you see the story that apparently there was a Forrest Gump two that was going to happen, and the script was the script was handed in the day before nine eleven? Are you aware of this? Yeah, no. I, I heard something about this, but like I would have preferred Gump two, Gump harder, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> like supposedly Forrest Gump was with OJ in, in the in the Bronco, uh, but like. <laughs> Yeah, there's a real script for this. The guy was talking about it. And it was going to happen, except it happened like the day before, like it was turned in the day before 9-11. They basically said, yeah, we can't do this anymore. I think that's a terrible, terrible idea, but I would 100% watch watch Gump in a Bronco. Well, that's the way I feel about the new Bill and Ted's. Like, I know it's going to be terrible, but I'll watch it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That'll do it. I think, we, I think we've done a good job of breaking down the 1999 movies. Again, if you want to get into a draw for 20 DK bucks, smash the like button for the episode. Leave your DraftKings handle in the comment section and tell me your five favorite movies from 1999. Or if you want to leave an audio review, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, five stars, DraftKings handle, something nice about the show. Maybe some future ideas of movies that we can talk about, movie ideas, uh, rankings, that sort of thing. So Dean, tell everyone where they can follow you and watch and listen to you. DFS underscore Almanac on the old Twitter machine. I'm on Rotor Grinders five days a week at the flagship to- show talking about DFS, talking DraftKings, uh, baseball, basketball, of course, winding down. And did want to get in the worst movie of the year, which I was holding back the entire time. Simon Says, starring Dennis Rodman, John Panette, and Dane Cook. Don't see it. Or I'm going to watch it right now. <laughs> I mean, it, it, I mean, Sammy, you can follow that with, with Bicentennial Man by Robin Williams and really get your 1999 <laughs> into your veins. Sammy, where can everyone watch, follow, and read you? Uh, on Twitter, at SammyReadFI. Roto Grinders does not put me on quite as much as Dean, uh, which for good reason, Dean's a goat. Uh, but I am on uh, the DFS Baseball podcast. I think I'm going to be on there once or twice a week with 
Mr. Tuttle 05 and Nate Noling and Dave Potts. So we have a good time on that podcast. Talk DFS baseball. So catch that thing. All right. I'm Pat Mayo. You can follow me at the PME on the Twitters, the Instagrams, and the Facebooks for you olds out there. Also, you can subscribe to the Pat Mayo Experience on iTunes, Stitchers, Podomatic, Spotify, wherever you can download podcasts. You can download the Pat Mayo Experience. Hope you enjoyed some of this chatter about 1999 movies. Maybe we'll do some of it in the future. But until then, I'll see you next time. Pat Mayo Experience! Experience!